we're thinking the Fed's going to be too gentle here with the economy. We need to differentiate what is a slowdown versus, so a basically soft versus hard landing. It seems like there's a lot of room for steam to come out of the economy before you start getting big cutbacks. Inflation is high, but this is the first time in a couple of years where there are no restrictions. Until we get a better sense on inflation and jobs, we're going to be fragile. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. Today, from our studios in London, we welcome all of you on a perfect day in London after the horrific weather in Switzerland. And we end an interesting week. And Lisa, the headline for this week, without question, is finally a bid to equities. Yeah, we had an actual buy the dip moment with the biggest inflow into equities going back 10 weeks. And we also see possibly uh, the first weekly gain in <coughs> equities going back eight weeks. People are interested. And to greet you in London, we're going to get to this in a moment. With, with Bramwell's gloom, we thought we'd get Ben Laidler, and we'll get to that here in a moment. I, I think we need to talk about what we've seen at Davos and how we bring it to London in the international sense of the city, the international sense of finance here. What we heard in Davos is we need international solutions to all these different crises we have. Some sort of cohesion to try to remedy the issues with high food prices, with high gas prices, with high tax prices at Heathrow, which is something that we discussed extensively yesterday. This definitely is a global feel that we saw in Davos. However, very much the focus is on Europe and what's going on uh, with Ukraine. Conversations coming up. Alarian will join celebrating Howard Davies' new book out. Francine Lacroix speaking with Sir Howard uh, in the last hour. We'll touch on that as, as, as well. But let's start. Let's get right to it because of the important conversations we have. And Lisa Bramwitz, I think, is briefing us as we stagger to the weekend. <laughs> this is going to be a really important day. At 30 a.m., we get U.S. personal income and personal spending. And everyone's been talking about whether the U.S. consumer, how much can that end up uh, really driving uh, further growth? And we are are expecting it to decelerate, uh, but I am curious to see uh, where we go there. 10 a.m., we get U U.S. University of Michigan sentiment survey for the month of May. It is expected to stay at about the weakest going back to 2011. How much does this change? We're not expecting much, but still a, a precursor potentially for what's to come. And surveillance is having tea today in London. Uh, and I believe you and I both had a full English breakfast, and we'll have a full English breakfast with uh, Ben Laidler yeah, of eToro and Stephen Major of HSBC, Mohammed Alarian of Bloomberg Opinion, Jordan Rochester of Nomura, some of the many guests that will be joining us here in yeah, London. A lot to talk about, and you know, I make a joke about it. The flight attendant on Swiss Air said she loved what we did in Davos, and she said, "Ask Lisa how the seven-year auction went." And it went really I, well. It went like it went wicked really, well. Really, really well. Were you Reason, watching it? We're talking Boston here this morning because. Is wicked, okay? It went wicked well, right? <laughs> yeah, it went really well. What people is the actually significance of it? What's the so what? People are starting to buy again. And this actually, to me, is one of the key conundrums, which is basically you have an <clears throat> easing in financial conditions because the Fed is saying possibly they're going to pause because of growth concerns, which sets them back to where we were before. How much does this become a problem? Because it's basically a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy. Okay, let's get started here. And this is the equity conversation of the day. Without question, in the great bull market, he was the most prescient with amazing courage the end of 2018 into phase one, phase two of this bull market in a sustained equity bull. We got an update from Ben Laidler, global market strategist at eToro. Thank you for greeting us here in London. This is your first time back to QVS, right? Absolutely. Fantastic. Greeting. End of the pandemic. Do we, does part of the gloom that's out there now, COVID gloom still? Uh, I think we've sort of forgotten about COVID, to be honest okay. with you, if, if you, you know, one of the things that worries me is that we maybe have completely forgotten about it. Um, but on, you know, on the positive side, with the, the, there are there are some real silver linings there, right? We've got a we, we, we've got a big reopening, rebound in, in some markets in some sectors, which we've sort of forgotten about amongst all the sort of doom and gloom that we've seen recently. I've got to say. COVID does not exist here. COVID did not exist in Switzerland. Nobody here wears a mask. It's kind of amazing. But I digress. Are growth concerns overdone here? I think so, uh, but I say that humbly. I mean, we are sort of in uncharted territory. Right? We've sort of never been here before. Uh, but yes, I think so. I mean, you look at the PMIs, they're slowing, but pretty solid. You look at the Q2 nowcast for the US, uh, it's actually better than it was in, in first quarter. Uh, you look at the yield curve, that tells you there's nothing to worry about. So, you know, I take all that with a pinch of salt, but I, 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 I do think we are beginning to build a base out of this vice that the Fed has had us in of pushing down valuations and pushing up 
sort of recession concerns. I, I think the fact that valuations come down so much and the fact that recession concerns have gone up so much, I think puts us in a place where we can start building a base here and you know look forward to okay. better times. But this goes back to this question, this catch-22 for the Federal Reserve, where basically the more that people take a sigh of relief and go back into risk assets, the more the Fed's going to say, oh, no, we're actually seeing an easing in financial conditions. We can't have that because inflation, oh, yeah, hasn't actually come down all that much. At what point does this sort of create this uh, ceiling for risk assets for the foreseeable future? I totally agree with that. The Fed is not going to let markets turn on a dime, and this is not 2018. The Fed's not going to run to the you know come to the rescue. Markets, is, there's no V-shaped recovery here. But I do think we can sort of build a base, and later in the year, when those when those uh, inflation concerns have, have eased, when when growth has, has eased a little bit, and the Fed's a little bit less worried about inflation, I think then we can begin to see that rally. But I think to your point, right now we just want to build that base. The rally will come later in the year. Don't, don't, don't bet on a V-shaped recovery right now. The Fed won't let it happen. Take the Laidler optimism, bring it to the revenue line of different sectors of the entire market against nominal GDP, which is a huge mystery. The combination of GDP and inflation, we really don't know that glide path down. Fold that into the revenue guess one year, two years forward. And, and that's... You know, I call it the $25 trillion question, right? I mean, does the U.S. go into recession or not? And what happens to corporates? You were talking about consumers earlier. That's been one huge anchor here. But the other one has been corporates, right? This has been a valuation-driven correction. It's all been about valuations. Earnings have been absolutely rock solid. If companies can keep delivering here, then we will build that bottom and we will start to have a rally. If we go into recession and companies crack right. uh, and, and they stop investing, we stop seeing the M&A, you know, those margins begin to come down, all the things that have held really solid so far, then we're in trouble. But I, I think we're still looking at a scenario of this, 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 you know, this modest slowdown. Companies, certainly big companies, can look after themselves. And, and you've seen that so far. They really haven't got the crisis memo. Um, mm -hmm. You're seeing the M&A, you're, you're, you're seeing double-digit CapEx growth. I mean, I can go on and on. I mean, they are telling you a very different message to what you're getting from uh, capital markets right this now. This weekend, you run into a mere mortal who's scared stiff. They've got cash. They're 15, 20, 25 percent in cash. They have losses. What do you tell them to do with that cash? Just dollar cost average it in. Like, you want to be in this Into what? Into, into value. I think the value rally has a very long way to go. Well, you know, we're allowed to name names. There's only five people watching. Banks, <laughs> defensive, toothpaste companies, what? All of the above, right? Um, I, mean, I, think, I think banks will do very well once these recession fears come down. They're very cheap, big dividends. I think, you know, value those, those, those classic defensives. Yeah. You, know, you want to be in this market, but you want to be managing your risks. That, that's the key here. What about airlines, considering the fact that you expect yeah. this to be the bigger su biggest summer of travel, and I'm about to head to the airport? Is that also a good bet? I think the reopeners, of which the airlines are one, are these sort of stealth defensives um, in some ways, right? Markets, economies are reopening. We're all starting to go on, uh, on, you know, to travel again. Expectations are very low. Valuations are very low. They've been holding up. They've been holding up really well, and I think that continues. So, what do you say to the people who say to you, you know, you've been drinking the Kool Aid. You're believing in a soft landing, and it doesn't exist. It's not going to happen. Right now, we're towing a line that just has never had a historical precedent before. What do you say to push back against them? I say, look at the buffers that are out there. We're coming from a very strong growth environment. So we're coming from a good place. Uh, the consumer is in a very good shape. Corporates are in very good shape. Uh, and you're already beginning to see inflation expectations rolling over, bond yields rolling over. You know, the Fed has been very successful at front-loading this, uh, this tightening of financial right. expectations tightening, and you're beginning to see it work. It's early days. Right. The Fed's not going to take its foot off the uh, accelerator anytime soon, but we are beginning to build, I think, that base for a rally later in the year. Let's go all hindsight. I want, you've, been, you've been the number one person I know of sustained, theorized bull market tone since November and December of 2018. How did you go long Christmas of 2018? I mean, that was a different world, right? We had, the, you know, we had a Fed put there, which we don't have now. So, you know, I, I, I am bullish with quite a lot of humility in this environment because we've never seen this sort of right. double-barreled Fed tightening. We've never seen these sort of triple whammies from around the world. I mean, it's not just inflation in the U.S. It's energy crisis in Europe. It's lockdowns, uh, it's lockdowns in China. I mean, my narrative here is that things get a little bit less worse. We've priced a lot in. We take a little bit of the pressure off. Okay. Markets will begin to move higher. It's not that... 
we wake up tomorrow right. and it's all sweetness and light again. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming in today. Ben Laidler has really given us a spirit here over the last number of years through the COVID of this financial system uh, will work. We've had a massive debate this morning, Lisa and I. Is the subway stop out here, is it bank or bunk? What's the, it's not what, a debate. What's the proper it's bank. Accent? I would say bank. Literally. Bank. Okay, it's, it's not bank. bunk. It's a bank. 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 Okay, we'll By get By the it. way, I have to always say that to be a bull, you have to basically say things are going to get less worse. That's basically as bullish as you get right now. I just think that that's notable. I just wanted to point that out and underscore that. The pendulum of less worse. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to frame out into Friday and a really important week, a reading, of course, over the weekend in the United States, Memorial Day, which will be a different Memorial Day with the tragedies we've seen uh, in Texas. Of course, uh, the NRA meeting uh, really front and center within the dialogue uh, this morning there. And then in the United Kingdom, I believe we have captured the prime minister on a train. Yeah, he was having a lot of discussions. A yeah, he was talking about what's going on with Ukraine and Russia. He was also talking, uh, I believe, about the windfall tax, which we uh, heard about yesterday from Rishi Sunak, what that means for some of the oil companies. A really key point for him. It's targeted uh, yeah. and transitory, and, which means it never will be. But that's they've got a whole long name for the windfall profits tax. Yeah, well, we'll Very get British. into uh, trying to explain the whole name. What features up 11. Let's do a data check, Lisa. Help me here. It's Friday. The features up 11. Dow futures up 37. Two cents. You know, the 10-year the real yield, I've got to be looking at, Lisa, here at 0.11. That is up down. Can you imagine a negative 10-year real yield again? Well, honestly, we have gotten more accommodative. Try to understand that at a time when inflation has not materially come yeah. down. Is that a good thing? You saw mortgage rates fall the most going back to April 2020 this past week. We're spreading it out on the football field. Coming up from the Queens Park Rangers, Mohammed El Arian. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson wants more military support for Ukraine. In an interview with Bloomberg, he urged that more sophisticated rocket systems be sent so Ukrainian forces can hit Russian targets farther away. Asked about negotiating with Vladimir Putin, Johnson said, how can you deal with a crocodile when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? It is the latest U.S. challenge to China. The Biden administration and Taiwan are planning to announce negotiations to increase economic ties. The talks would focus on enhancing economic cooperation and supply chain resiliency. A deal would fall short of a free trade agreement. Beijing has warned Washington about its relationship with Taiwan. And the White House is scrambling to do something about record high gasoline prices in an election year. Bloomberg's learned the Biden administration has reached out to the oil industry about restarting shuttered refineries. The average price of a gallon of regular unleaded gasoline stood at a record $4.60 Wednesday. Senate Democrats said they were a bit more optimistic about a compromise with Republicans on gun control legislation in the wake of the Texas school massacre. Democrats appear to be willing to accept incremental steps. Many senators are going home for a 10-day recess and will meet with voters who may pressure them to take action. In Shanghai, it's a sign of the extreme steps being taken to keep factories running during a lockdown. Workers at an Apple supplier Quanta computer started to revolt against their overseers after being locked down in their factory for almost two months. They fought with guards and rushed past isolation barriers in search of daily necessities. The system forces workers to live and sleep on factory sites. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Back. We should not be ideological about this, we should be pragmatic. It is possible to both tax extraordinary profits fairly and incentivize investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like previous governments, including conservative ones, we will introduce a temporary targeted energy profits levy. Secretary Yellen on the floor of the Congress with Democrats and Republicans, and they almost agree on something. 
can you see them all going? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I we should think institute so. that. I it think is, we should it institute is that. It's extraordinary how they, uh, they do that. We're having a lot of fun here, and the biggest fun we're having right now, I mean, the, the levy, I love this, a temporary targeted energy profit levy. I stood outside uh, Queen Victoria Street today waiting for Sir Howard Davies to come. I told him I wouldn't go in the building uh, until he showed up with Sterling under 120. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll make an exception. Yeah, I was about to say, it didn't and get there. <laughs> we went up the elevators here uh, it, it, at the building, and he was trying to explain to me, temporary targeted is great, but the question is the investment side of this windfall right. profit. What do they want to see them invest in? What's going to be okay yeah. for them to actually deal with? And not only that, but what's normalized profits, right? Because that's where they're going to roll it off. Is that actually going to happen, or is that basically just an excuse to keep going? Normalized profits. We will see. Let us move to another story here. And for our American audience, I guess the basic idea here is is you move from London north, 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 and you go up where your ancestors were bakers. The prime minister has family from Darlington, which is this side of Scotland, like northeast, think Newcastle. Okay. I think I'm I'm getting there. You're doing you're doing great. I, I'm, I'm trying. And Kitty Donaldson uh, on on the train with him, and I, it, you got to believe with the news flow that you and I look at and go, really. Is, is this is a guy that really needed a quiet train ride. Yeah, he did, but he didn't get one, and he talked a lot about Ukraine, uh, and he really was trying to give a feeling of confidence amid, frankly, uh, a difficult uh, leadership right now. It is a challenge, to say the least. With our Kitty Donaldson on the train, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I think it's very, very important that we do not get into, we do not get lulled because of the incredible heroism of the Ukrainians yeah. in, uh, in pushing the Russians back from the gates of Kiev, yeah. uh, because of their, their amazing valor of, of President Zelensky. We should not believe that this problem has gone away. On the contrary, mm. I'm afraid that uh, Putin, at great cost to himself and to, uh, to, to Russian military, is continuing to chew through ground uh, in Donbass. He's continuing to make uh, gradual, uh, slow, but I'm afraid palpable progress. And therefore, it is absolutely vital uh, that we continue to support the Ukrainians yeah. uh, militarily. And, and indeed, I think that they, what they need now is the uh, type of uh, rocketry, um, uh, a multiple launch rocket system, MLRS, yes. uh, that uh, will enable them to uh, defend themselves against this very brutal Russian artillery. Okay. And that's where the world needs to, needs to go now. Okay, final question, and this is about President Zelensky. You've, yes. You've stood shoulder to shoulder with him. But there's certain calls around Europe, perhaps from France, from Germany, to maybe settle with Putin, try and try and. Uh... But I would say to any I, I, to any such uh, you know proponent of of a deal with Putin, how can you deal? Yeah. How can you deal with a crocodile uh, when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Uh, you know what's the, what's the negotiation? Uh, and and that is what Putin is doing. And any kind of he will try to freeze the conflict. He will try and call for a ceasefire while he remains in possession of, uh, of substantial parts of, of do you, Ukraine. And you say that to Emmanuel and, Macron? And I, I make that point to all my friends and, uh, and colleagues in the, in the G7 and at NATO. And by the way, everybody gets that. Once, once you go through the logic, you can see that it's very, very difficult you must to, get a, to, to get a negotiated solution. We desperately need, need it to end. Uh, we de the world needs it to end, yeah. but the, 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 one, the one way that it can end is for Putin to accept that, uh, uh, let us say that uh, the denazification of Ukraine yeah. has taken place, oh, I see. Uh, and that he's able to withdraw with dignity and honour, and that would be. And what's, what's that, your, that, what's, that's what needs to happen. I, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that there were any Nazis in Ukraine. No. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the interesting things about the situation is the very strong support that Putin commands in Russia for, what he, uh, for anything that he says or does. Yeah. Uh, I think he has the political margin of maneuver uh, to make an end to this. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in conversation with our Kitty Donaldson and what's so important there on the London Northeastern Railway above the Darlington is as in America, Lisa, you really wonder the support that these 
uh, politicians will have in the West if this war drags on months or even years. Well, and that's the reason why the temporary windfall tax is actually so important because it caters to that popular uh, kind of feeling that if prices are going to go up and if it's at all connected to what they're seeing in the war right. in Ukraine, how much does that have to be offset uh, in other ways? And that's definitely what they're trying to do with this some six billion uh, dollar windfall tax. I thought you and I underplayed this in Davos. We didn't talk that much about the war, which was clearly front and center in the hallways of the World Economic Forum. And so important to me was my conversation with Sir Lawrence Friedman, who was shocking in 2018 how he predicted so much of what we see now. And he, like Admiral Stravitas in America, is completely focused on the Black Sea. Greg Vellier writing this morning about Odessa is the, is the pivot point of trying to get the food out for some of these nations. And that's so important because it's not just Western nations. You know, people are saying Davos, uh, this sort of center <clears throat> of elitism and, and, and sort of uh, very much the developed world of the Western world of Europe. But frankly, a lot of the developing world relies on Ukrainian wheat on Ukrainian uh, rice, on Ukraine, not rice as much as uh, Ukrainian wheat, Ukrainian corn. How much do they try to I don't think uh, they really grow rice in that. Ukraine. That's Maybe right. I said, no, 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 I said not it's rice. It's okay, I, I asked the, the finance minister from Malaysia, how's that wheat crop going? And he sort of crossed his eyes. <laughs> said, uh, How'd that work out? Such an ugly American. <laughs> Talking is, about being an ugly is, American. Is, 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 you know, you know. Well, speaking of breakfast, um, Lisa, you know, Lisa's all yogurts and berries, you know it. And she breaks the rule, so we're here for one day, and we hope to be back soon as well with John Farrell, of course. And we had to test out the Farrell breakfast. And I, I, do they eat this every day? I'm still full, I've got to be honest. But you know, my observation is that the eggs yeah. are, are a different color here. They're completely different oh, color they're, than they're, in the United States. Oh, they're called States. healthy. Yeah. <laughs> they have rules, it's just, it's just like, like the French, they have rules. And, and you know what, the toast comes on shelves. It has a little we, wreck. We got to do this again. On radio, you, I'll describe it to you on radio. This is a full English breakfast, which was, I think, 42 pounds or whatever it does today. And I go counterclockwise, but we don't have the hour. And the most important thing here is everything has to be mushy gushy. Yes, yes. The mushrooms are mushy gushy. Yes, it's mush And on the toast. tomatoes are mushy. And there's like, what do you think, 5,000 calories? <laughs> Different shades of mush uh, that you put and, and uh, pieces of toast on a shelf. The, Honestly, it was actually really delicious. The typical surveillance breakfast is Tang and a Pop-Tart. I mean, we all have our different uh, breakfasts as well, but we thank the Ned Hotel. Some of our contestants stay at the Ned Hotel Poultry Lane in London. Markets, it's been a good week for equities. The VIX under 28 decisively, 27.17 on the VIX, that's important. Oil, very importantly, Brent moving up 117 level. Stay with us, Stephen Major next on Yield. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg surveillance from our studios in Queen Victoria Street in London. Stephen Major to join us here in a moment. Lisa, help me with a data check because we're both well fed this morning. <laughs> futures up 12, down futures up 35. The VIX, the VIX is a big deal to me. The 30 level drifting away a more constructive equity market, Lisa. Yeah, it's going to be the first uh, weekly gain if it holds going back eight weeks. And I will just say that the stability in yields is not a coincidence. We've seen the 10-year yield basically do nothing, uh, but lower than where it has been, 2.73%. And this, to me, has underpinned a lot of the quiescence that we've seen this week and this feeling of optimism. And part of that is the real yield, which is a nominal yield, take away the inflation belief, and you have a residual. And all of a sudden, Lisa, maybe not today, is we go to the real yield in New York this afternoon, New York time, the 10-year real yield is 0.10%. Yeah. That's maybe what no one's talking about this week that matters. Yeah, and frankly, five-year real yields are still negative, and they are only heading more negative. At what point are we seeing yeah. accommodation actually uh, reconfirmed in markets, which goes exactly against perhaps what the Fed would like to see? We welcome all of you on radio and television uh, worldwide as we shake out our time here for one day in London. We hope to be back not next week but maybe the week after i think that's the jubilee oh yeah for the queen i think we're attending are we going to have another breakfast like that or are we not we are going to have another that? breakfast like I don't this think we're going to survive it joining us right now one of our most important guests because he is always theoretical and foundationally based in the study of fixed income stephen major joins us global head of fixed income research at hsbc i got to cut to the chase you moved to hong kong how's hong kong doing 
So far, so good. I, I can't speak for what they think of me, but I'm quite happy there. <laughs> So you far, feel so restricted good. in Hong Kong. I mean, we get all the news and and the current giving us wonderful briefs as well. Yeah. Stephen Engel reporting, but do you feel restricted day to day within the new Hong Kong? No, it's it's uh, actually it's possible to move around quite freely. People are wearing masks, <clears throat> but it, it it seems seems to me that we can do what we need to do, and and so I, th I think some of the view from outside may not be consistent with what we see inside Hong Kong. In the weekend, let's do something for those that are learning fixed income. Many of our guests say devolve down and look at the inflation adjusted yield. Should I be looking at the real yield or should I study the nominal yield? Um, both, but uh, the one piece that's missing there is the forward real yield. I heard you both talking about it just now. The five-year forward real yield. So let's take the five-year forward one-year rate. It's moved from about minus 150 to plus 100 in the last uh, six months. So that's a 250 basis point move. Now you can take that from tips. It's a, it's a forward estimating where we're going to be in five, in five years' time. Now that says to me there's been a big tightening that you can't see in the spot. So this, the spot moves uh, by less than that. Uh, so from the Fed's point of view, and they look at things like this, they'll look at the forward break-evens, the forward reel. Um, it's a bit of a worry because, strangely enough, the market has tightened a lot for them already. And they've only done one small 25 basis point rate hike and a 50. That's all they've done. <laughs> and and uh, they're, they're, they're nowhere near neutral on that basis. But the forwards are already saying that they've tightened. Are you saying, uh, Stephen, this is really important, that the Fed will not be concerned by a loosening in financial conditions this week, that it won't necessarily alarm, that it will just be a pause in the incredible tightening that they were getting concerned about? Yeah, from, from my perspective, I'm a bit concerned because we're forecasting lower yields by year end. We have a 2.5 percent 10 year Treasury forecast. And I'm a bit worried that it's happening too soon. And to answer your question, Lisa, uh, that, that's also consistent with the financial conditions not tightening. Uh, 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 further. Now, they, they have already tightened quite a lot, to, to, to be fair, but the, the, the Fed's not well served by the market um, uh, softening up uh, the financial conditions. And then, you know, they want you all to think that they're hawkish and they're going to hike like crazy. Then you'll behave and the consumer will calm down and the inflation will gradually fall back to target over a few years, right? Yeah. That's what they want. The trouble is we want everything now. Which is the reason why, and if you go now, it changes the behavior later in the year. If yeah. we see an ongoing return to sort of uh, frothier conditions or perhaps the buying the dip kind of mentality, where would you take the 10-year projection for the end of the year if it is currently now 2.5 percent? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's going to be so quite so binary. I'm sorry if I'm comp complicating this, but I think it's important to understand. If they hike with their eyes closed and they carry on doing it into next year, then the 10-year Treasury should be 4%, right? If, if they take into account that we could have a recession by 2024, they're going to be back at zero uh, within the next year or so. Therefore, the yield should be below 1%. So the trouble is, is that the 2.5% is sits right in between the, those two yields. Now, um, the human brain isn't clever enough to cope with that, unfortunately, because we, we want it all in simple terms. We want a simple base case. We want, we want a path, everything. So what do you do with that as, as someone well, who has to give projections and well, forecast, yeah, forecasts? That, that's how markets work, though. Markets, market, markets are trying to incorporate all available information. It's not like they're going to jump suddenly from being hawkish to dovish. There's a transition that's gradual over time. And so, of course, the growth risks are growing. The inflation risks are maybe peaking. So it's happening, right. happening gradually. Uh, we do our research here at Surveillance, and one thing that's really important is to understand the last time we had a bond bear market this bad, West Ham was looking at relegation. They had a goalkeeper, Phil Parks. They hired for more money uh, than God. There was 78, 79, yeah. and now there's now. Yeah. Have you seen a bond bear market price down like we see right now? Well, this, um, this, this year's decline in, in uh, bond prices, so, so the total return, the, the losses this year have been the biggest on, on record for 40 odd years. We've had two consecutive years like this. It's also, I think, the first time since 1994 when both bonds and stocks right. have gone down. Now, this is, this is important because um, it's not just a bond bear market you're talking about. You're talking about a stock bear market and questioning the whole role of 60-40. Mm -hmm. 
my view on this is that bonds have repriced sufficiently. And when we study things like these drawdowns and the move in the forwards, etc., I think I think bonds are offering much more value to diversify in a in a equity bond portfolio now than before. I want you to speak to people that could care less about the forward market. Yeah. Page 14 of your 28-page <laughs> uh, mid-year outlook. They're in some form of fixed income. They're down three years coupon, yeah. and they're saying, "How do I regroup?" What is the thought process in a bond bear market to yeah. try to catch up? You won't get it back this year. And, and you, you ha that, that's how you have to think in bonds. It's a slow right. grind. Bonds aren't about all of the rock and roll that you get in equities and in tech, tech stocks and Bitcoin, etc. They're not, they're not the same, right? So b bonds are there to be balanced in the portfolio. So, so Tom, you, ha you have to accept mm -hmm. it's, it's a, down, a down year. You, you, but you enter now with fresh cash and, and you're getting you have three percent in the longer end. That's what people have been doing. They, and if you look in IG credit, you, you're now you're talking about five percent, six percent. But how many of those buyers who were coming in were from Japan? How many were from China? And I say this because actually yeah. on a currency hedged basis, you can get more, or you actually can get less in the United States uh, right now yeah. than in Japan. They won't be coming from Japan because the Japanese curve is steep in the 10 year. Does plus. that matter? So, well, it means that their own market works better, right? So, so that it means that the hedge doesn't work. They're better off being at home. Yeah. So that that's true. Um, money might be coming from other parts of the world. I mean, you mentioned China. China right. seems to be slowing down. Uh, the question is, is there a capital flow from that part of the world into the U.S.? Well, it's difficult because the capital account is locked down. But but something seems to be happening. Uh, so so if China is slowing down then that's, that, that's important to the Fed as well. Okay. We don't care what you think about fixed income. The reason we had Steve <laughs> Major do. in... For, I, oh, excuse, excuse me. me. Lisa Come on. cares. He's I don't give a, a damn. one of the preeminent the, minds in fixed income. Also in who's full English incredible. breakfast. Oh, Steve geez. Major, would you explain this? I mean, really? you grew up with this. Do people really eat this in England? Not if you want to live a long time. <laughs> So the, 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 the tradition of this in the major childhood, what was the tradition? We didn't of this? eat that stuff. My father may have done, but the, the, the thing is, is it's it's not good for you. You you, you need to you need to stick to the. Do the we blame the this on Churchill? I mean, is this like out of some movie? You know, out of 1946 with Winston with a cigar in his mouth and the third glass of scotch at 7 a.m. Yeah, I, I like your comments about the eggs, though. The fact that they're, they're yellow, that's because they are proper eggs. So whatever you're eating in the States, well, they're I, don't, orange. I don't know. They, 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 but they're the right color for but They're organic. You know, he says proper eggs, and I miss John so much. No. <laughs> so he get, actually, he abandoned us because he was get organic eggs. We, we get have organic. organic eggs, but, but <laughs> I must admit, the vitality of the food here in Europe in general, I think the best food's in Istanbul in my travels. I guess you're going to have to take like, us. We're going to, well, we're, we're road, road trip. trip in Istanbul. Yeah. When they close the boss for us, it'll be a reason to go. Stephen Major, thank you so much for the He's energy to run. come in to He's Queen Victoria Street and the briefing here. I'm not having a full English tomorrow. What we're going to do is a full English data check uh, right now. And we can do that, uh, Lisa. And I'm sorry, the headline number for me with uh, Christian Mela coming up from J.P. Morgan is Brent Crude. 116.85 with a 117 handle uh, an hour ago. Yeah, where does this go? And frankly, what does this mean for some of the refined products? Especially, I'm also curious to know how the windfall tax plays into this in terms of whether this is just the beginning of a whole host of taxes that are placed uh, around the world yeah, the on oil are companies. We're see yeah, exactly. So, if, so, what's going to be the I consequence? Will you see more investment in oil and gas production, or will you just see basically uh, loopholes and frankly a retracement? Because uh, yeah. they're going to be, uh, there's going to be a, a somewhat of a resentment among some of the oil and, and gas companies. You just I, I tried to pay for my full English in crypto, and they wouldn't take it over at the net. I mean, twenty eight thousand eight hundred seventy four. It's been a grim, grim week for crypto. Yeah, how much of your assets do you have of the triple leverage all of I have, all I have less than Scott Minard. He was there, and he says up to 400000 And then that news he made in Davos on an 8000 on crypto. That's a Look, bold call. It hasn't been the uh, safe asset that a lot of people had expected. i, I got to say, I think you should start the uh, triple leverage all crypto fund. No, we with tried the, that. With, with the goat farm. I think yeah, it will go we, well. We tried that. Coming up, Alina Polakova, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for European Policy, of course, on Ukraine. From a beautiful London, stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Boris Johnson pulled no punches when Bloomberg asked about the prospect of negotiating with Vladimir Putin. The British Prime Minister responded, how can you deal with a crocodile when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Johnson said that the Russian president is completely not to be trusted. A record volume of Russian oil is on tankers and unprecedented amounts are heading to India and China. Asia overtook Europe as the largest buyer of Russian oil for the first time last month. Other nations have restricted Russian oil and gas imports. And for the first time in two years, profits at Chinese industrial firms declined last month. Industrial profits fell 8.5% in April from a year earlier. Covid outbreaks and lockdowns disrupted factory production, transport logistics and sales. And it's a heartening development for the Federal Reserve, but maybe not for American workers. Staffing firms say that companies are now becoming more cautious after handing out hefty salary increases over the last year. Economists expect data to show annual wage growth this month was 5.2%. That's down from 5.5% in April. The Fed sees wage growth as a big source of inflation. Texas Governor Greg Abbott reportedly has dropped plans to address the National Rifle Association's annual meeting in person today. The NRA is meeting in Houston just days after the school massacre in Uvalde, Texas. According to the Dallas Morning News, Abbott will be in Uvalde. He'll deliver a taped message to the NRA instead. Former President Trump will deliver his speech in person. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Europe, finally, they're changing their tone. You know, they need a stronger euro to bring down inflation, but they need to realize this actually strengthens consumer sentiment as well. I think the euro will find a new range, a higher range, but still, even with a higher range right now, it's still going to be very, very much undervalued. Jeffrey Yu of BNY Mellon, his paper this week is the most controversial securities research on Global Wall Street. Go to BNY Mellon and Dr. Yu will tell you why you need to care about the Plaza Accord. He aggressively pushes against the zeitgeist that says forget about the early 1980s. It's not a proper analog. And Jeff Yu says no. We welcome all of you to London on our way back from Switzerland. We will, we will be in New York Monday. Did you know we're not working Monday? I've been trying to tell you that, and you keep saying you're going to get into the office anyway. Yeah. So I guess that Tom Keene will be in the studio saying hello. Well, I'm going to be hello? there, and the only ones can be with me is vet bills. So we'll be looking for that on Monday. Tuesday, we'll start out. I believe there's been a Pharaoh sighting, and he may be I think with so. us on Tuesday as well. Right now, on Ukraine, someone that's given us wonderful perspective, Alina Polakova joins us right now, president of the Center for European Policy Analysis. And Alina, you and I have the honor of speaking after good treatment by Sir Lawrence Friedman of King's College on war and on the uniqueness of Ukraine. Friedman is focused on the Black Sea. Are you? Absolutely. You know, for years, uh, I and SIPA, the organization I lead, have really raised the alarm bells about how critical the Black Sea is for regional security. Of course, we're seeing that today. Russia's blockade of the Black Sea is raising food prices across the world and is already contributing to huge food insecurities and crises. And this is really the reason why the Black Sea should have been an area of focus for a long time. Does the Russian Navy have enough control to control this, the Black Sea, to control food, and if they do, how does NATO, and for that matter, Turkey, respond? Well, they certainly have enough control to block Ukraine from sending any sort of grain, corn, exports of any kind outside of Ukraine. I mean, they're holding Ukraine hostage, and they're holding the world's food supply hostage right now. And so the Russians have said, look, uh, you know, if you remove sanctions, we might let some of these ships go through, which is, of course, you know, terrorist-style tactics. Um, in the Black Sea, Turkey is really the other main actor, and Turkey is, of course, a NATO member state. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, without a direct confrontation with the Russian Navy, uh, it's hard to see how we get that blockade off. So Russia right now does have uh, essentially dominance over the Black Sea to control the passage of ships, to control basically global trade.
What's the red line here, Alina? How does this look by year end if there really is a problem with the lack of food in certain places? You know, I think at some point uh, NATO is going to have to act. Ukraine uh, has a very low capacity in the Navy. They have very low capacity in the air as well. We've known that for a long time. Those are their main weaknesses. So at the end of the day, we have the right to enforce freedom of navigation. The Monroe Convention, uh, which governs international uh, Navy movements in the Black Sea, uh, does specify that there should be freedom of navigation in international waters. Russia is obviously blatantly violating all of those rules right now, but uh, threats aren't going to work. I think we need to see some real action and we need to see some ships, uh, NATO ships, UK ships, other ships going through those waters to say, look, uh, we're going to enforce freedom of navigation because that's the law. And if you want to have a confrontation over that, we're going to have to talk about it. Uh, but right this now, it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight. Alina, this is tiptoeing into a hot war between Western nations and Russia. At what point do we cross that line if there are ships from NATO that are sent to the Black Sea? You know, I mean, this is the fog of war that we're currently in. Um, there is an increasing risk of direct confrontation, certainly in the Black Sea. Um, the battle over uh, this very small uninhabited island called Snake Island is becoming this critical uh, issue uh, for the broader battle um, in Ukraine. You, you know, Russia has the huge advantage because, of course, it's controlled Crimea now for eight years. And Crimea's strategic position has allowed it to project power across the entire waterways. You know, I think we have to think about what this means because, as you say, we're not just talking about Ukraine and we're not just talking about the Black Sea. We're really talking about global, global food supplies and food chains that are going to be affecting not just the most vulnerable countries, but also affecting, you know, Europe, the United mm -hmm. States, all of us. And so I think we have to start thinking about what is the balance to be struck there. My preference, of course, is that the Russians come to the table and we can engage in some diplomacy um, over this issue. But so far, they've shown very little interest in that. Alina, I asked Sir Lawrence Friedman a question from the giant Thomas Schelling, of course, who did so much thinking about this across the arc of the uh, post-World War II uh, era. And I asked Thomas Schelling once simply, how do wars end? With all of your knowledge of how wars end, what do you guess to be the outcome of this war in Ukraine? Well, wars in Europe of the 20th century uh, have ended in a negotiated settlement after a, a defeat, a big military defeat. Look at World War I, look at World War II. So it's wrong to say that all, world, all, all wars end in some sort of negotiated agreement. That only happens after a capitulation. And so at the end of the day, one side will have to lose. Uh, the Ukrainians, of course, said they'll fight to the last man standing. Uh, the Russians are making some progress, but increasingly this looks like it's going to be a very long grind that could last many years, in fact, um, without either side really admitting or really seeing themselves as a the victor or the loser. You know, I think it's still in our interest to ensure that Russia loses this, because at the end of the day, that's the only way they'll come to the negoti negotiating table. That is what European history yeah. has shown us over and over again. Alina, before we let you go, just quickly here, what role does oil play? And frankly, uh, the idea of Europe limiting their imports of gas from Russia uh, going to have on the duration of this conflict? You know, all of these kinds of sanctions, um, particularly on oil, because we're not talking about gas here. Gas is the Achilles heel mm -hmm. of uh, the Russian war machine. You know, right now, the Russian government is maintaining its war effort in Ukraine, primarily through energy payments that it's receiving. Uh, it's likely about to default in the next several months on some of its debt payments because of the United States actions on sanctions. But uh, on oil, you know, this is going to be uh, a hit if Europe moves forward with this, but it's certainly not going to, you know, uh, kind of buckle the Russian economy because at the end of the day, what likely will happen is oil prices will go up. And that will, in the, in the grand scheme of things, of course, benefit Russia as one of the largest uh, oil energy exporters in the world. So it's a really mixed bag as to where, whether the European oil embargo, if it happens, uh, will affect Russia in the short term. It may, in fact, in the long term, benefit it slightly uh, from rising uh, prices on oil. Dr. Polakova, thank you so much. It's a wonderful briefing here on a Friday to get us into the weekend. Alina Polakova, 
with the Center for European Policy Analysis. I really want to touch on the data here, the dynamic of a constructive week with futures up 15, Dow futures up 56, and the VIX, 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 big deal, 30 angst, 40 big angst. We go the other way, 29, 28, to see a 26 uh, VIX today would be a good way to end uh, this week as well. The dollar, a little bit of weakness. Euro 106.99 from London. This is Bloomberg. We're thinking the Fed's going to be too gentle here with the economy. We need to differentiate what is a slowdown versus, so basically soft versus hard landing. It seems like there's a lot of room for steam to come out of the economy before you start getting big cutbacks. Inflation is high, but this is the first time in a couple of years where there are no restrictions. Until we get a better sense on inflation and jobs, we're going to be fragile. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen from our studios in London today. Jonathan Farrell, not with us, recovering from a full English breakfast. We expect to see him on Tuesday as well. We are wrapping up a week here to get to the weekend, to get to the June mid-year outlooks, to get to the jobs report. We go back to America to the key thing for Chairman Powell, which is the American labor economy. And frankly, if what we got yesterday in terms of initial jobless claims is any indication, the labor market is still incredibly strong. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, it's a great thing if people can get jobs and if they can get paid more, but it creates, again, another problem for a Fed that's trying to thread a needle that's really hard to thread. I'll steal from Mohammed Alarian. If you'd read your book, you'd know this. T decisions matter. How do you make a T decision that's like like Robert Frost, the road not taken. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it's Matthew that. Matthew Alarian That's great. doing his Robert Frost <laughs> imitation. The T decisions now are impossible given the set of uncertainty. Which is the reason why I find it fascinating that Fed Chair Jay Powell actually did capture as much attention when he came out and said, this is not going to be nuanced. We're not going to look at the specific drivers of inflation. We're going to just go at it because we need to get price stability. If that's the case, is it a good thing or a bad thing that you're seeing actually an easing in financial conditions this week and that you're seeing people actually expect less from the Fed as you start to get a slowdown priced into certain assets? For those of you on radio, for me to turn to Lisa, I got to do, you know, it's like it's like snaggle push years ago. Exit stage left. If I freeze in this position, can we still do the show? <laughs> I think so. I, think I don't know. My back is, you know, it's like we're getting there. Well, let Let's me tell you what's going brief. on. Let's move forward <laughs> Let's here and try on. to brief exactly. ourselves into Friday and particularly brief ourselves into next week. Honestly, this data I think is uh, understated okay. this week. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. personal income and spending. And I go back to Brian Moynihan of Bank of America coming out and saying the consumers actually were spending 10 percent more in the first two weeks of May uh, than in the same period last year. That is an inflation adjusted more than 1 percent of real spending more. How much do we see that play out? at a time when you continue to see consumers have plenty of cash in their coffers. 10 a.m., we get U.S. US University of Michigan sentiment survey for the month of May. It is expected to come in, uh, remaining around the lowest going back to 2011. Does this matter? A lot of people have basically said people are saying lots of gloomy things, but they're still going out and buying. And today we are doing Bloomberg surveillance from London. We are having tea in London, and we are also going to be speaking with Mohamed al Arian coming up of Bloomberg Opinion and, of course, uh, the longtime member of PIMCO, longtime thinker uh, who has incredible views on everything. Jordan Rochester of Nomura, he will give us his sense on the dollar. And Christian Malik of J.P. Morgan Securities, really interesting. The interview of the day. Well, it's such an important moment where you've got gasoline prices rising tremendously. You've got energy prices causing a personal consumption crisis in the U.K. And you're dealing with how do we offset this at a time of an escalated conflict uh, in Ukraine driven by Russia. Let's bring this together. Jordan Rochester will join us here on this uh, weaker sterling, weaker euro call. That's about dollar dynamics. Christian Malik will join us with that 100-page opus from J.P. Morgan on higher oil prices. That deals with the dollar. And right now, one of our great contributors to Bloomberg Surveillance, a gentleman at the University of Cambridge and Queen's College, and of course, with all his work on the game theory of our global system, Mohammed El Arian this morning. Dr. El Arian, I loved your note because Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon agrees with you. It is front and center right now. As Volkert Landau of Deutsche Bank said on February 24th to us, 
The dollar matters, and a dollar too strong gets in the way of a recovery. Are we at a point where a resilient dollar is a problem? First, welcome to you and Lisa to the UK, and thank you for bringing us good weather. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, we, we, are near the we are near the point where it, the dollar is too strong for the rest of the world. Not for the US, but for the rest of the world. Um, you know, it's this phenomenon I call little fires everywhere. And whether it is food prices or oil prices or strong dollar, that contributes to the little fires everywhere. The answer, by the way, is in the hands of the other countries, not the U.S. There isn't much the U.S. can do about a strong currency, but there's lots that other countries can do. The panel that I had yesterday in Davos, Dr. L. Aaron, included Sir Lawrence Friedman. And the most quiet moment in that too short an hour was here where he linked dollar dynamics into our food crisis and into the memory of Tunisia, the Arab Spring. Our Eric Martin, as well, is focused on your Egypt. When you look at the fragility of Egypt and the memory of the Arab Spring, what is the model to help begin to solve the crisis? It's a big issue. Um, Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF months ago said a cost of living crisis in the West is the risk of famine in commodity importing developing countries. That's particularly true for fragile economies. For economies like Egypt, like Turkey, um, the decision is how much you subsidize and how much you pass on to the consumer. And food is a particularly delicate issue. Most countries will end up subsidizing. So you will unlikely to get a repeat of 2011. However, and this is important, you have to worry about the finances. This is a very difficult environment for commodity importing developing countries, Tom. Mohammed, before we move on uh, to uh, what's going on in rates and how we move ahead in this, uh, this economy, what do you think in terms of offsetting those costs of something like uh, the windfall tax as just was announced here in the United Kingdom? You know, I've been arguing for a while that the right thing to do is to impose a windfall tax and to use the proceeds to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population. And that's what the UK did yesterday. Um, is the windfall tax perfect? Of course not. It's not a first best solution, but there are no first best solutions in this world anymore. It is by far superior to every other second best solution. And I think we're gonna have more countries look at this as a temporary measure to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population. Is it just going to be the oil and gas companies, Mohammed, or are we also going to be looking at potentially uh, for coal companies and, and, and copper and all the other commodities in addition to food producers? I suspect we'll be focused on oil and gas. Um, going further than that gets really tricky very quickly. So I suspect it will be focused on oil and gas. Moving forward, Mohammed, we were talking in Davos about how the banner headline was about the Ukrainian war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. But really, under the surface, when you peeled back the onion, it was all about China and the fact that any kind of prolonged shutdown could torpedo global momentum. How closely are you watching that? If we do get the lockdowns continuing to year end, does that mean that we are going to be close to a global recession? Yeah, I'm watching it very closely. Um, because what happens in China impacts both global aggregate demand and global aggregate supply. Uh, we forget that China is a major consumer of products also made elsewhere. We saw what the retail numbers looked like. They were pretty horrible. We also are reminded how important China still is in the supply chain. So I look at this very carefully. Lisa, the concern we have, and I know that you are very tuned to this, is that the three major areas of the global economy are slowing at the same time. And there is no compensating locomotive anywhere in the global economy right now. So we've got to be careful that we, we don't get the self-feeding process. And this is important because the marketplace has embraced the possibility of a pause in September. Mm -hmm. Be careful, because the only reason the Fed would pause is because demand, demand has come down really fast. Right. And that's not going to be good for risk assets. 
Mohammed, I want to go back to the only game in town. And folks, this is, you know, you sit there and you go, well, why is this guy so visible? What is it so special about Hilarion? And what he has done is articulate game theory across our economics, finance, and investment. And one of the nuances, Mohammed, of the only game in town is separating, and in this case, Chairman Powell's desirable from Chairman Powell's feasible. What is the feasible set right now for the American Central Bank? I think, at best, the feasible set is what Chair Powell called a soft-tish landing. And the issue is really important. I think the time has passed for a soft landing. We could have done it, but that would have implied the Fed moving nine months ago. It should have, it didn't. So instead of tightening into a growing and dynamic economy, it is tightening mm -hmm. into a slowing economy. So it is very difficult to get a soft landing. So the best you can hope for right now is a soft dish landing. What's the probability of that happening? Not as high as I would like it to be. Um, I think the Fed is going to have to decide between two policy mistakes, hit the brakes too hard and risk a recession, or tap the brakes in a stop-go pattern, including polls right. in September would be an example of that, and risk having inflation well into 2023. Dr. O'Larian, Olivia Blanchard was talking about Stan Fisher and said he was our great North Star, which is an extraordinary statement about the gentleman of 1998. We have a conceit now that our currencies are more floating. Can the release valve for Chairman Powell, as he approaches the feasible, be dollar dynamics because we have a more open, more floating currency system? Um, it's not open enough in the U.S. economy for that. Look, the solution to all, all our issue is a surge of productivity. If we get significant productivity growth, we can reconcile all sorts of difficult trade-offs. So the key issue is whether we get a surge in productivity, and you can get that with all sorts of things happening underneath. It would be wonderful, for example, to also have labor force participation go up, especially among women. That, that would help. It would be wonderful to have supply chains improving. That would help. Um, is all that going to happen in the short term? Very unlikely, unfortunately. Mohammed, you're talking about how a softish landing is looking like the most uh, best outcome, and it looks not that likely. Do you think that the recent data that we've seen, and frankly, the assumption in markets that momentum is waning and that the Fed's already getting what it wants, do you think that that's gotten ahead of itself, or do you think that they're onto something, that there has been already a slowing that will make it easier for the Fed? So I think the marketplace is going through two processes. One is a dip was overdue. We had eight weeks of successive declines. And clearly, there are people who are finding bargains. And there are single name bargains. And the fact that we've had the largest inflow into the equity markets globally for the last 10 weeks is significant. We are seeing dip buyers. So you have a very technical reaction after eight straight weeks. That I totally understand. What I don't understand is the notion that suddenly the Fed will be able to hike twice and then, and then take it easy and pause. It, that, the only reason, as I said earlier, that happens is if demand collapses. And if demand collapses, equities are not going to do well. You saw what happened when Target announced that they were being impacted not just on the cost side, but also on the revenue side because of high inflation. And the last thing this equity market needs right now right. is concerns about earnings. Mohamed Alarian there with the idea of technological progress and productivity moving us forward. He is, of course, for the University of Cambridge. Lisa Abramowitz and Tom Keane from our studios in London. Futures a daily lift up 12, Dow Futures up 30. Stay with us, the VIX 27.20. Good morning on radio and television. Rather than using its power to reinforce and revitalize the laws, the agreements, the principles, the institutions that enabled its success so that other countries can benefit from them too, Beijing is undermining them. Under President Xi, the ruling Chinese Communist Party has become more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad. 
On a May afternoon, the Secretary of State of the United States with a strategic statement by the Biden administration on China. Widely anticipated, it will be digested, of course, in Beijing as well. And the immovable force in the calendar for the Secretary of State are the Chinese meetings in later autumn as well. This is normally what we would digress to here in London with our Jack Fitzpatrick in Washington, but this is a different Friday. Jack, Lisa and I are out of touch with the agony across America today, and it centers on the National Rifle Association. The history of the NRA is young boys out in the woods with a single shot Remington shooting squirrels. The modern reality is quite different. What will the reality be at the NRA meetings in Texas? Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch exactly what the reality is because the shooting in uh, Uvalde has required a response from across the aisle. Uh, but on one hand, you are going to see uh, former President Trump speak at the NRA event. The Texas governor, Greg Abbott, uh, according to the Dallas Morning News, is supposed to pull out in person and not be there, but give a, a video address. So a bit of a, a half measure in terms of exactly what his involvement would be. Uh, and at the same time, you are at least seeing an attempt uh, on Capitol Hill to legislate in response to this in some way. Uh, John Cornyn from Texas has kind of been deputized to be the, the lead from Senate Republicans mm -hmm. on doing something, but it is a, a very narrow scope that they're talking about. So there's a, right. a, a, it, there's a necessity for action in, in, and sort of careful rhetoric, but you are going to see still a very strong connection between Republicans well, and the NRA. In the time that we have here, I want to address the gentleman from Houston. John Cornyn grew up partly in Tokyo. He is an internationalist by American standards. He went to UVA Law School. He has been with the judiciary and now an esteemed senator of Texas. How does John Cornyn speak to the strident Republicans that are against anything to do with gun legislation? I think in this case, he would uh, probably point out to them that there is Republican support for something very narrow uh, along the lines of incentivizing states to put in their own red flag laws, maybe not even a federal red flag law. Uh, if he's talking to uh, real Second Amendment advocates, he's, he's still negotiating something that is so narrowly focused that this is not it's something you'd call an attack on the gun lobby or, or the gun yeah. industry. Uh, I don't think this is something that would entirely alienate him from that part of the, the conservative America. Jack, is there anyone left in Washington right now? I mean, I believe that Congress is now gone for 10 days, even though they're dealing with what's going on in Ukraine, as well as China and some of the issues that we have seen there. And now, of course, the tragedy that we saw in Texas. There was some discussion about either uh, some members staying in Washington uh, to keep talking about this gun bill. Uh, to be honest, a lot of the time when they're still negotiating and they're, they're not holding floor votes, they've got each other on speed dial. So there is activity. I'm not entirely sure if uh, some members are going to stay just to have some in-person meeting. But yeah, they're, they're going into recess. There's not going to be real legislative activity. It's not an ideal time probably for for them to mostly leave Washington, uh, but at the same time, they can do work and, and are expected to continue to kind of uh, try to negotiate Whoa. something narrow on guns. And what they're going to do, Jack, is they're going to go home and they're going to talk to their constituents. And when they're in a restaurant or in a cafe, people are going to come up to them. Are they going to be talking about what happened in Texas? Is there any groundswell in certain support or is it going to be all inflation? Why are my gas prices so high? The gun issue has gotten enough of, an, uh, of, of a response so that that is a, clearly a, a priority. It's something, you know, you're going to see President Biden uh, go to Uvalde on Sunday. Uh, it's, it's in the news cycle enough so that I don't think this gets entirely washed over by all the other issues. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for a lot of these issues, especially that Democrats want to bring up, things like inflation are the, the, that's the overriding concern. 
Uh, and it, I, I don't know exactly how long the pressure to act on a gun bill of some sort will last, but it, it is there right now. What is an assault rifle used for, Jack? I mean, do you use it for pheasant hunting or squirrel hunting? Or maybe like the Swiss, it's sort of maybe in your home and you never take it out. I mean, it's an AR-15, Daniel Defense. I don't recall this in my ute. Yeah, I, I, that gets at what you alluded to earlier about the evolution of the NRA. I, it, I, I can't tell you from personal experience what you use an AR-15 for, but I can tell you it's a bit more of a cultural issue than just hunting. There you uh, go. I mean, it was 2016 when Ted Cruz fried bacon by putting it around the, the muzzle of an AR-15 as a, a campaign stunt. That may get a little more toward it than shooting pheasant. Yeah. Unlike a full English breakfast, it's a full cruise. Jack Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. Just brilliant there. Uh, as always, in Washington today uh, is all turned to Texas in this convention and the former president of the United States. How odd is it, Lisa, to be in Switzerland and the United Kingdom and they have their own societal tragedies looking back at the United States? It's an anachronism, or not even that. It's just is so uh, such an aberration. I was actually reading an article about how in the developed world, the United States is an aberration. There are other, are other nations with the same level of gun violence, but they tend to be in the developing world. And how do you parse out that gap? What is going on in the United States is something of great study. And, and as, as we've talked to our people in New York, the balanced debate here, away from the stridency, and as Jack Fitzpatrick mentioned, campaign stunts to fry bacon on a given muzzle. They do get really hot. I can, I can take that from experience. But you, you really wonder, Lisa, at the end of the day, what's the first step forward, that incremental step that the senator from Kentucky wants to try to agree on with the senator from Manhattan well, and Brooklyn. Pulling your, putting your politics aside, right? It doesn't matter what side you're on. No one wants to see kids killed. No one wants to see innocent children gunned down in a classroom. And I think that everyone can agree on that. It's just the pathway uh, to get there that has been the question for mm. so long. Let me do a day to check here. We do this on a Friday. You know, an interesting week and attuned to next week's American jobs report as well. I can't remember this. Farrell would know at the ECB meeting. Yeah, it's, it's in like, June. You know, it's like out there. It's out there it's somewhere. It's a Linda Ronset date. It's out there somewhere. Futures up seven, Dow Futures. We quote the Dow Futures for John Farrow. Futures up three. The VIX 27.24. Yeah, we, we miss him so much. I know. He didn't want to be with us because we were going to humiliate him. I had fish and chips last night. Farrell went ballistic and emailed me and said, I can't have mashed potatoes while I have fish and chips. That's un United Kingdom me. Well, yeah, it's chips are the potatoes. Really? Bloomberg surveillance from our studios at Queen Victoria Street. Spectacular studios. If you are ever in London, I will give you the best set of stairs in all of London. Show up at Queen Victoria Street. Go around the corner about one full English breakfast. And there is a Roman museum. And the museum itself is fantastic. Roman remains that we found. Mike, did you see that? Mike Bloomberg's in a Caterpillar bulldozer. And he's out back digging up the London terrain here. This is like 10 years ago. Mm. And they found Roman ruins. I missed it. Was you he missed there it. Today? The stairs down to the Roman ruins is sobering about the length of soil across the centuries yeah. of London. There's your history uh, lesson for this morning. Romain Bostic's going, what? Future's up nine. Dow Future's up 15. The VIX 27.21. And Roman, thank you so much for the advice where you said, Tom, lose the full English. Romain Bostic in New York. <laughs> Hey, guys. Uh, good morning. Well, back here in the U.S. where you guys are out on your European vacation, markets continue to sort of oscillate around here. It's really all about a lot of the retailer stocks and, I guess, consumer spending and how it's holding up. We did get those Costco numbers here, and it was interesting. Wow. I mean, comp sales growth was actually uh, pretty good here, but there were some concerns, really, about margins. Those margins continuing <laughs> to compress, and this seems to be the story for a lot of the retailers out there, even the ones that are, I guess, to a certain extent, supposed to be recession-proof. Costco shares down about a percent on the day. 
day. And then you have Big Lots, which has a similar model to Costco, though not quite the subscription model. Those shares down 20%. That was a different story. Comp sales were down 14%. And more importantly, they posted a surprise loss for the quarter, flipping from profitability to a loss. And once again, it's about margins. It's also about inventory. Inventory, they are jumping almost 50% in the most recent quarter. And that was also the story for Gap, which reported last night. Their inventory levels were up 34% year over year. And now a lot of concern that a lot of these companies that have been posting these high inventory levels are now going to be in a position where they're going to have to start discounting, discounting into an environment where they're already being squeezed with regards to their profitability. Gap share is down 18 percent. This was really an ugly report here, and most of the commentary we got on the call didn't provide any clarity as to what the path forward here to reverse that trend. Now, one of the bright spots out there in the retailer space is Ulta Beauty, Tom. Everyone is out buying makeup and other sort of products to make themselves oh, look really? good as they're out, you know, tracing up and down the Roman steps or whatever folks are doing these days, those shares up about 8%. Not only that, but they actually raised their outlook, and they said they're seeing no shift Shocked. in consumer spending there. Yeah, it's, it's big. You know, you need your Romaine, lipstick, you need your makeup. Romaine, yeah. Romaine Afterthought has 52 <laughs> bottles on her bathroom sink. Yeah. I have no idea other than Alter Beauty's making it hand over fist. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, well, they have a way of convincing people that you always need more to look well. And then, of course, there's the <laughs> really? saucers. Yes, they do. They're great, great marketers over there, if I may say that. Workday, we should point out, keep, uh, keep an eye on the software stocks today, Tom. I know you're big keen on that, but Workday missed big time here uh, on their backlog growth, which has been decelerating, although their top line growth was mm -hmm. still pretty good. But we're we're seeing this all around here where investors really punish these companies if they don't continue to post that phenomenal growth that they've been used to. And one bright spot here in the chip space, Marvell Technology, a maker of right. semiconductor equipment here, higher by about 4% on the day, Tom. Romain Bostic, thank you so much. This is really a joy to come back to London for the first time off this horrific pandemic and talk to someone who writes a research note that in every case triangulates. What you do in the foreign exchange market is you look at not the yen, but always a currency pair, two different currencies. And then the pros use the Bloomberg to triangulate. They'll look at euro dollar. They'll look at dollar yen. And then the pros go and look at the, to bring it around circuitous to euro, euro uh, yen as well. Jordan Rochester no, uh, joins us now, G10 FX strategist from Numeria. Great to catch up with you Hi, Tom. Uh, this morning. Is, is it a time here where in the parlance you can make big figure bets? Absolutely. The, I mean, the volatility is You're in the excited. Is you wake up high. in the morning after your full English, you're like, let's go. Well, we've just had 4% in the dollar selling off over the past few week, weeks. Right. So it's really big moves on the back of very little. So it's a very volatile environment. So it's a volatile environment, but it's an easy one to get right if you look at, for example, all the calls uh, for parity that have gone the way of the English breakfast for someone like Stephen Major. Uh, it's now at 107 and seems to have gotten some foothold there. Indeed. One of the biggest flaws in my sort of way of approaching things is getting too sort of set on these, on these big parity figures. But I do think if you look at Euro where we are here today, we've had a big 4% rally higher. What's really strange is this Chinese renminbi is weaker, but Euro stronger. The main trading partner of Europe is under pressure here with their lockdowns and not enough stimulus, yet the Euro stronger. And it's all boiling down to what I've been surprised by is the US terminal rate pricing really softening. And that's kind of allowed this weaker dollar. But I think we've probably had a little bit too much of that dollar weakness and we could see Euro go back down lower next week. And that's been basically your call, right? You've been th talking about how the euro does not look cheap here, even though it has been uh, cheaper than it has been in years. What's the level you're targeting, given the resilience that we've seen over the past few trading sessions? So if you use valuation models, you have two ways of doing it, really. One is deflating it by consumer prices or one by producer prices. Most of the time, producer prices are the things that you actually trade for foreign exchange. And producer price inflation in Europe is nearly 40%. It's higher, it's worse than the 1970s for Europe. It's not the same for the US. Right. So that's really devalued the value of the euro for its medium term sort of level. So 109 is where I'm getting my sort of fair value for the euro. But I think given the trade deficits collapsing, given their main trading partner China is under right. pressure, given the food crisis, the energy crisis, euro to parity is still possible in the months ahead. There's a lonely crew out there, Focus Landau, Deutsche Bank, Elarian at the University of Cambridge, Jeffrey Yu with a brilliant note from BNY Mellon saying we need to start learning lessons from the Plaza Accord. They're not saying we will see a Plaza Accord, but consensus says no, this time is different. Should we worry about a dollar so strong for EM that we have to adjust a, a dollar? 
Well, the main question is, Tom, do you think policymakers can actually work together to achieve that? Because everybody's facing an inflation problem right now. If you have that plaza accord in, at the sort of EU-US level, I can imagine it could work. But then all the other partners would be also wondering, well, what about EM as well? So for China and the US to coordinate on currency manipulation after years of the US saying China's been manipulating its currency seems quite a, a big stretch of the imagination. But I could see it on the EU-US level, but my base case is we don't get some sort of agreement like that. What's the main driver right now of currency volatility? Has it been central banks and differentials there, or has it been economic outlook? Well, both. So the economic outlook drives the central banks. I think in terms of what's been driving the markets, hello, Mark. Uh, in terms of what's been driving the markets and central banks, we've been essentially seeing a food crisis, an energy crisis. Yeah. And that's translating to central banks overreacting, thinking this is a growth shock. And yeah. I think that's probably wrong. This is an inflation so he's shock. Jordan, to hello. He's I'm... trying to basically uh, talk down the clock. So you yeah, can't he, talk is, he is. He is. He is. <laughs> right, Tom. Lisa, great to see you here. Sorry for interrupting your show. Thanks, Sorry thanks for, for, thanks the for set. crashing the set. Well, I did hear Jordan discuss the dollar. Um, Jordan, I believe you're going to be buying the pints today. Do you want to explain to the viewers why you're going to be buying pints today for me? Yeah, two weeks ago, me and Mark had a little cheeky conversation about the dollar, and he was right, and I was wrong. Don't okay. sound so shocked. Yeah. Don't sound so right, shocked. What was it? Come on, elaborate. So, to walk, I mean, in terms of my thesis, the trade balance of euro has collapsed. We've got the situation with growth, but Mark was looking at the US terminal rate pricing, I think, when he made his call on yeah. shorting the dollar. And I I just didn't see that happening and I got that wrong. So I think the growth expectations have come down much quicker. We've traded the stagflation theme much quicker. So how much longer can we do for that? Do you think we have another week or two of that theme or do you think it turns around very quickly? I don't know about you, Mark. Most people are on holiday next week in the UK. We've got the Queen's Jubilee. It's kind of tough, but there's one we thing to watch say. out for. Uh, We've got European fine. inflation Is next week. Gonna buy I'm going to be having you know, a hangover all, all week after the pints are going <laughs> to be buying today. And you know what? Today. He's going to get some vindaloo to uh, go with it. Are you auditioning? What is this Pharaoh's idea? You're like auditioning <laughs> I, for the damn show. This crashing. is Pharaoh's idea. The important thing is to not ask permission pull the old fart off stage, right? I, I, am I doing a good job? It's a good job. Oh, you're, doing, you're doing a great job. What, I, I, I hate to say, i got to get something out of this conversation. Do you want to join for pints? They're all on join. I may. tell for. which beer will you quaff. Uh, I'll be having an ale while I'm in London. An ale. Do you have a brand that we like? We like Swan. I like experimenting with the local ales. Th I'll, that's I'll, very I'll, good. I'll rely on Jordan's yeah. guidance of what I should be I'm more of a Camden trip. guy, so Camden House, Camden IPA, so we'll be trying some of that as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate the bet that you guys had. Honestly, I think that the key question and the bigger and, and the sort of uh, broader question, yeah. I know you're going to go into beers no, no. and, and different things. No, no, I want to state, folks, and for those of you that are going, what in God's name is this about? You're not alone. This is the fun and spirit of Wall Street, which I think is perceived in the media wrong, and that everybody's like, oh, my God, he was wrong. Jordan Rochester was wrong. Shoot him. No. <laughs> this is people get it wrong all the time. I get it wrong. Were you like, look, what's the level of wrong here, Cutmore? Was he like way wrong, wicked wrong? This time the timing worked out quite conveniently okay. for me, which is why I'm choosing yeah, extremely. But if you're not getting it wrong, you're not saying interesting enough things. <laughs> you need to be getting it wrong well, almost half from the those time. Lessons, that's Hopefully right. not more than half the do time. Do you think I look good at a podium? What do you think? Uh, am I allowed to say no comment? Is that appropriate I, I, at this I point. Guess, I, I don't want to get in more trouble by answering honestly, and I don't want to lie live on air. You look great at a podium, actually. For the radio, Tom is moving the podium back and forth. Mark Cudmore just crashed our set of M Live here at Bloomberg. And honestly, though, Jordan, there is a question of whether basically this goes to a timing issue. What is the correct timing right now for currency bets? Is it a one-week timing, uh, as you can see, uh, that seemed to have backfired for you this time? Well, like, four, it's been 4% in two weeks. That's a big move. So yeah. I, th I think next week we've got low liquidity with half right. the UK on holiday. Flash inflation for Europe will come in right. really strong. So I am worried that Euro goes a little bit higher next week. Then after that, it really is a fade. One of my best conversations in Davos was with the giant Kishore Mabobani of Singapore, Mark, where you are truly expert. When China opens up, the yes. lockdown's over, how do those currencies react to perhaps a China boom? I think it'll be massive for the region, but it's, it's when is the real issue, because many people in Asia think it's probably going to come sooner than people in the U.S. We're running the MLI okay. Pulse server this week, and we can see there's a massive regional divide in expectations around the China path from here. Is he with us next break? Does it, do we keep doing this? I just crashed temporarily. I, don't, I, mean, I think oh, this I'm, I'm going to go yeah. pizza now, actually. Like, great, great. Oh, good. Well, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a full English pizza. I'm not working here. Can I'm you just imagine, taking my bet. Would you, would you imagine what a full English pizza looks like? Oof, oh, my goodness. Lots of mushy stuff on top of it. Much. I think Jordan Rochester, thank you. I think Mark Cudmore, thank you. Good. From M Live. I gotta thank I'm you. I'm gonna say thank you. Folks, M Live is what the pros look at on the terminal. It is the really pro 
dialogue of what's going on in the market. We devolve it down to Dow Jones futures up three. This is <laughs> what Bloomberg. Do you mean we? Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Boris Johnson pulled no punches when Bloomberg asked about the prospect of negotiating with Vladimir Putin. The British Prime Minister responded, how can you deal with a crocodile when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Johnson said that the Russian president is completely not to be trusted. The Russian owner of the $325 million super yacht linked to billionaire Suleiman Karimov has lost an appeal to keep the U.S. from seizing it. The Court of Appeal in Fiji has dismissed the peti petition by the vessel's legal owner and investment firm. Countries have been going after the yachts, planes and villas of Russian tycoons who have been put on sanctions lists. And for the first time in two years, profits at Chinese industrial firms declined last month. Industrial profits fell 8.5% in April from a year earlier. COVID outbreaks and lockdowns disrupted factory production, transport logistics and sales. And it's a heartening development for the Federal Reserve, but maybe not for American workers. Staffing firms say that companies are now becoming more cautious after handing out hefty salary increases over the last year. Economists expect data to show annual wage growth this month was 5.2%. That's down from 5.5% in April. The Fed sees wage growth as a big source of inflation. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott reportedly has dropped plans to address the National Rifle Association's annual meeting in person today. The NRA is meeting in Houston just days after the school massacre in Uvalde, Texas. According to the Dallas Morning News, Abbott will be in Uvalde. He'll deliver a taped message to the NRA instead. Former President Trump will deliver his speech in person. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We have to acknowledge that oil and gas demand continue to grow very, very sharply. Inflation is high, but this is the first time in a couple of years where there are no restrictions and people are going to be driving and flying as well. So both gasoline and jet fuel prices will continue to rise. Why do people watch Bloomberg surveillance? Yes, they watch for Mark Cudmore. Thank you, Mr. Cudmore, from the M Live appearance here uh, moments ago. But they really watch for world class hydrocarbon coverage. We're going to do that. The jewel of London, Amrita Sen, just brilliant on the microeconomics of energy uh, there. Right now, we're going to go to the jewel of New York. Uh, Kriti Gupta here on a gallon of gas. Kriti, what do you've got? On a gallon of gas, Tom, and a little fun fact, I used to work for Mark Cudmore. That was a treat for us all. On the chart of the day, though, let's talk about the gallon of gas here because this is important going into Memorial Day weekend as a lot of Americans hit the roads and really take those road trips. What I'm looking at here is the amount of work in minutes at the U.S. federal minimum wage it takes to I pay for me. a gallon of gas. 40 minutes, Tom. You have to work for 40 minutes to get one gallon of gas. And for our radio audience, what you need to know here is that the line just goes upwards and upwards and upwards. And really, you haven't seen that kind of acceleration since going yeah. back to 08. Kriti, help me here, folks. This is the single best chart Kriti Gupta's ever done. Because, Kriti, what you're comparing is for people who spend a lot of money on food and a lot of money on hydrocarbons. Right. And this is really important when we talk about the lower income part of the community, the ones that are getting hit hardest by inflation. If you look at retail earnings, for example, over and over again, you hear this theme. If you are a wealthy consumer, you are insulated to some extent from the inflationary pressures. If you are on the other side of that spectrum, you absolutely are not. Think about the people who do, to your point, Tom, have to go get groceries, have to fill up the tank. Right. And right now that's getting harder and harder. We move from the gorgiosity of Amrita Sen and Kriti Gupta to the gorgiosity of Will Kennedy, our executive editor for Energy and Commodities at Bloomberg. We have Christian Malik coming up here with J.P. Morgan. I don't. What is it? In the next hour, Lisa? Yeah, it's in the next hour. Next hour, something uh, like that. Hundred pages from J.P. Morgan, where the price of Brent is going to go up because of the microeconomics of Amrita Sen. State their thesis. That is it. That supply doesn't come on. Or is it demand just takes off? It's a bit of both. As Anita said quite rightly, we're getting into the demand end of the season. 
Memorial Day driving season, people flying, uh, diesel demand rates is strong. So we've got strong demand despite everything else going on in the economy. Supply just can't really respond. There's very little spare oil supply capacity in the world. Uh, OPEC has a couple of million barrels, but it's reluctant to use them. At the same time, uh, a lot of people are reluctant to buy Russian crude. And the big problem we have in the market, especially in the North American market, is a lack of refining capacity. And that's why you're seeing the gasoline prices, diesel prices rise to records, even though oil is a long way off those records. What does a windfall tax or subsidized uh, kinds of efforts do to that demand? How does that affect the situation and, frankly, the quicksand of higher prices? So you've got a lot of governments around the world, the UK yesterday, as you say, uh, but also people cutting gasoline taxes in different countries, other European countries subsidizing natural gas and electricity demand. When you subsidize something, make it cheaper. People are going to use more of it. So you're adding fuel to the flames. The problem with these uh, measures is that they do help people. Of course they do. But they don't solve the problem is that we have a very, very tight energy market globally. Um, and people are talking all about subsidizing consumption. It's strange that politicians aren't talking more about how to reduce consumption, make things more efficient. Um, so, yes, there are dangers in these sort of measures, as you say, Lisa. Are you starting to see uh, more uh, finances diverted into renewable energies and other sources? And I say this after having come from Davos, where everyone was talking uh, in a very you know, theoretical way. Are we actually seeing it on the ground accelerate uh, in the wake of some of these price increases? To a point, I think that a lot of these technologies, wind and solar in Europe in particular, the economics make a lot of sense. But there are real problems to accelerate things, I would point to two. Supply chains have hit the solar industry. Uh, a lot of materials that go into EVs, for example, like lithium, are hard to find. It's hard for car makers to build as many EVs as people want to buy. And then there are regulatory problems. You need a lot of permissions, especially in Europe, to build a solar farm, a wind farm. It takes yeah. years, and it's not happening as fast as it perhaps needs to. We get a daily lecture. Sometimes it's only weekly lecture, but poor Abramowitz and I get a, a daily, weekly lecture from young Pharaoh on how hydrocarbons start in London. He's always quoting this LME thing versus what we do in Chicago. In that, you are the foundation of what we do on hydrocarbons worldwide out of London. We're always talking about, what's his name, Javier, what's his name? Blas. Blas, Javier Blas. 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 I want to talk about Rachel Graham, because you go to the Bloomberg and you look at oil, and here's Rachel Graham out of Moscow, out of Platts, out of commodities under you and, and, and Stuart and the rest of them. And she's got five charts on this disaster we're in right now. Tell us about those five charts. Um, you know, what Rachel's really looking at is just how tight product markets are in Europe right now and that the problems that refiners are having just getting enough product to people. What the big problem in Europe is that we relied hugely on Russia for our diesel in particular. We're getting a quarter of our diesel from Russia and that's not happening anymore. And it's really shaking up the whole global oil market. It means that we're importing a lot of diesel from the US at a time when the US needs it. And this tightness caused partly by the pandemic, caused partly by the war, is just spreading through the whole global well, energy market. I mean, I think this is critical, and I think, frankly, this has been the most important interview of the week because Lisa and I are working on this, and just look, tell me if this will float. Al from New Jersey. Ah, oh, Heathrow, Al, they're out of jet fuel. Can I pull that off? Sorry, can you pull what off? Can you? Can I call he the guy in New stay. York and say, they're <laughs> out of jet fuel in London, we can't get home? <laughs> Does that work? Does that help me here? Well, if you go on the TV now and tell everyone to get on a plane right oh, now. Oh, they're out of jet fuel. <laughs> oh, this yeah, yeah. is going to really Run to the gonna, airport. Are we going to really on. run out of jet fuel? We're still live. You know that, Tom. <laughs> oh, oh what a saying. shock. That never <laughs> stopped. Know. That never stopped. <laughs> I know that. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> this is important, though. Are we going to run out of this stuff like, you know, VW rabbits and lines in 1978? I think there are people who are scared that in certain airports this summer it's going to get hard. I mean, there are airports in the US that aren't on pipelines, right? Heathrow. Heathrow. I think, I'm afraid to tell you, Tom, Heathrow's are connected to lots of pipelines. Damn. There's a pipeline from a big Exxon refinery straight into yeah, Heathrow. Me. It's going to be tough. Will it's going Kennedy, to be tough. Go away. Okay, Thank honestly, you so much.
Did with you our leaders. Did you hear his sigh? Do you when know you I made a him? video? He's I, I got to You know, <laughs> do we, have to we, be on. <laughs> we love Big Jet Live. The guy, the guy's oh, yeah, out there in the great. rain at Heathrow yeah. on that day when, it, you know, no jokes. It was wicked, wicked dangerous. And I'm literally making a movie last night of the gorgiosity coming in on Swiss Air, going triples. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're the only. That Heathrow is. Can I just say uh, Heathrow's yeah. great? The yeah. What is it about the taxes at Heathrow? The taxis. The taxes. English. The American levies. English. The levies. Taxes. The levies. Oh, the levies. Well, yeah, it's an expensive airport, isn't it? It's I mean. transitory and temporary, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's, said uh, you know, we've got to get our, we've got to get our butt. I got to go know, data check, or they won't let me come back to America. Uh, red and green on the screen. Futures up two. Dow futures go a bit negative. VIX uh, 27.30 dollar. Well, uh, churning a little bit uh, weaker. Yen 126.90. Euro 107.09. With Will Kennedy, we have to quote, quote petroleum. Brent crude 117 the barrel. On radio and television. Stay with us from London. This is Bloomberg. Are we going to be in a recession or are we going to be in a rocky landing? Maybe soft landing, but I think soft landing is kind of off the table. The consumer will follow where the labor market goes, and that's why I really emphasize the labor market. The inflation story, and probably I think for me, more important, the job story is still something in flux. If they want to get inflation down to 2% within six months or even one year, they're going to have to overdo it. If Powell overshoots, we are going to see a material slowdown. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning from London. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Uh, Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow is off because he does not want to have to deal with our English breakfast references today. And he will come back uh, on Tuesday and tell us all the things that we got wrong, I am sure. We are a countdown to the consumer in the United States as we're going to get some spending data here in about a half an hour time. And I really do wonder uh, what this will show if it confirms the Bank of America view of the strength of that consumer, Tom. <laughs> Well, the, the consumer is a huge, huge question here, uh, uh, Lisa. And, and what I would say, and, and I'm going to go to a comment made by the great environmentalist and economist Lord Stern of London School of Economics. This entire week that we've had, people are puzzled. And you're right in that they're no more puzzled over the consumer than anything else. They're no. just puzzled. And frankly, I think that the biggest takeaway from Davos this year, uh, where we had just came from, was that there was so much bearishness that there was a bit of optimism that perhaps that was the consensus. And perhaps that's the optimism that you're seeing today with possibly... And this week. Yeah, this week. Yeah. Uh, possibly the first weekly gain going back in eight weeks. And in the bond market there, you know, you, we make jokes about the seven-year auction, but it certainly reaffirmed the appetite out there uh, globally for U.S. paper and 2.72% on the 10-year yield. You know, not the tick to tick, but on a week or two week basis, that's a real adjustment. Tom Keen cares about bond auctions. Oh, I just do. have that. I mean, honestly, that's my I big do. takeaway from that. You were watching the auctions yesterday. I, I was. I mean, I mean, there they were. Our schedule here is to be in London today. Monday is Memorial Day in a fractured United States of America. We'll be in transit. John Farrell scheduled, of course, to be with us on Tuesday. Uh, as well. And then we'll begin an eventful week looking at the American labor economy and on to a critically important ECB meeting. Maybe the one on eggshells the most in Davos was Christine Lagarde. You're going to give us a brief here for the hour? Like, what do we have coming up? Sure. Or, I mean, a half an hour. You want a brief get about the dash to Heathrow? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to dash to Heathrow after this. And luckily, I have the ammunition for it because of my English breakfast that I'm still full with. But we are going to be looking at personal consumption, uh, personal spending, as well as uh, personal income at 8.30 at 10 a.m. We get uh, University of Michigan consumer right. sentiment, which is going to probably come in around the same level as it was before at the weakest level since 2011. And we have a slew of incredible guests on Honestly, Christian Malik, we've been talking Christian about this, are, coming yeah, up of J.P. Yeah. Morgan as we try to discern yeah. the dynamics of an oil market, a crude market into right. oil. I told Mohammed Alarian folks that Malik was a more important interview today than Dr. Alarian, and he hung up the phone. Yeah. <laughs>
Worked out well. Liz Young never hangs up the phone. She's hugely qualified. She is at SoFi. Anthony Noto's wonderful experience in direct finance. This is not consumer finance. It is not lightweight. And when you have Liz Young uh, spiriting your investment strategy from her work at BNY Mellon, her chartered financial uh, analyst work as well, thrilled to have her today, but with a much more in the trenches view. Liz Young, forget about the spread market. Forget about hyper pro fixed income analysis. How do people out there recover from massive bond price losses? Well, the massive bond price losses, I think, really occurred earlier this year. The first quarter for bonds was really painful, and it was also really painful for stocks. So that was a tough quarter to get through, where you have both bonds and stocks going down at the same time. And everybody that had been screaming 60-40 is dead was sort of saying, I told you so. It didn't work in that first quarter. But now we're in a place where bonds had sold off more than stocks in the first quarter. And in the second quarter, they had a chance to rally back. And some of the diversification benefit is here again, at least it is in the last month or so. Now, moving through the rest of the year, it's yet to be seen what's going to happen. It's really dependent on what the Fed actually does and how the narrative shifts. So I think, as you guys have already pointed out, the consumer is really the most important data point here. All right, Liz, you've gone from advising uh, on institutional investors, and right now at SoFi, you deal much more with retail investors and, frankly, younger ones at that, as some of the, uh, the tech-savvy uh, prowess of SoFi will cater to. How is that different after all of the retail interest that we saw of younger individuals? Is that shifting at all as a result of some of the turmoil of 2022? Well, the difference in the investor base has really shown a lot of different preferences for what they want to be invested in. It, it is a much more tech-savvy base, right? A younger generation is much more tech-savvy, just more used to that. So there is more interest in the titans of tech and investing in things that are communications-based. They're not as interested in traditional finance companies. There's not a lot of investment in things like big banks or just finance in general. So there are different preferences there. The other thing is obviously a huge interest in crypto and a lot of opinions on what central banks control and what we can do in the economy and the control that we're under as far as central banks go around the world. So <clears throat> it is a completely different narrative. There are different interests and different risk appetites. I think that the investor today, and this isn't necessarily just younger investors, but a lot of investors today have become much more short-term focused because we're hanging on data points every week. We're watching the market every day. And when you have big swings like this on a daily basis, it does cause people to be much more short-term focused. Whereas financial advisors and maybe more experienced investors or ones of yesterday are more concerned with a five to 10 year period, diversification, traditional asset allocation. So, Liz, how do you direct then your comments, considering the fact that they will uh, possibly have uh, a, a shorter time horizon, greater risk appetite at a time when we also are watching tick by tick with an incredible amount of uncertainty and humility, uh, each data point not knowing which way of the T, to quote Tom, uh, the Fed is going to go in and, frankly, which way the economy is going to go? Yeah, well, so if we compare this environment to, say, the environment of 2020, when a lot of those newer investors came into the system and were trading and they got really interested in it, which I think is wonderful, this, however, is an environment where I think you need to do less. Because as things change on a daily basis, you can feel like you're wrong on a daily basis. And that's when you start to make mistakes. That's when you start to make reactionary moves in your portfolio, trading type moves instead of investing type moves. This is a time where if you want to buy things because you have cash on the sidelines from sales earlier in the year where you took profits, that's great. Start dripping <clears throat> in to some of those things that are interesting and that are going to look like bargains in three years yeah. time. But this is not a time when you try to chase and call a bottom, call a peak, call an inflection point, because honestly, inflection points are happening daily. Liz, I want to go Friday nerd on you. I know you can handle this. It'll be fun. 
I want to talk about, as you mentioned earlier, the 60-40 diversification model, which clearly has been tested in the recent months. I want to go back to Peter Lynch, the giant at Fidelity, in his famous word, diversification as well. That starts with the Markowitz history, the whole CAPM, and, and, and the giant Markowitz on how you do this, how you diversify. What have we learned about the diversification of 60-40 in the last quarter? In the last quarter, we've learned that it is actually back and it is working again. Now, the reason that it started to be talked about that 6040 was dead is because we went through a 40 year rally in bonds. So it didn't Thank seem you. like bonds were going to be able to provide the diversification for the drawdown in equities. Now, the whole point of a 60-40 is 60% 60 equities. Equities, of course, can have deeper drawdowns than bonds, so you want to buffer that drawdown. And for an investor, it's really important to avoid those huge losses in stocks. So bonds were supposed to provide that. But if you remember what happened in the last five to 10 years, we've had this huge growth in alternative assets. I would actually put crypto into that category, but alternative assets, Thank you. so things that can provide another layer of diversification that are now available to the individual investor. Previously, alternatives were only available investors, high net worth, and institutions, now they're really available mm -hmm. widely. So the 60-40 has turned into maybe something that includes, I don't know, 10% alts, maybe 20% alts, depending on the investor. But it is something that is maybe a little bit right. antiquated. But bonds have provided diversification in the last few months. Did she just call me antiquated? I think that she's saying <laughs> concepts she are. Are you trying to get Tom. her? Liz no, Young, Liz, you thank you so you much. Our regards to Mr. You. Noto and your good experiment. So far there with a real edge to the consumer and a technology forward uh, pace. That was brilliant. And this is, these are some really important questions. I think everybody knows I'm not big on 60-40. I've had the honor of talking to Markowitz about this. And, and I'm not... I'm just not big on the 60-40 certitude. Well, honestly, I think 60-40 means something so different for each individual, right? I mean, yes, honestly, when we yes, talk to people, critical. they yes. talk about the mix of the yes. 60, the mix of the 40. And so right now what we're hearing is basically how much yeah. of a mix of everything until you just disregard the whole yeah. uh, thing in general. I'm going to go with uh, Liz Ann Saunders over at Schwab. Say good morning to Dr. Ross up at MIT. Factor analysis was really important as a buffet against the mathification of the business, as you see, was 60 And frankly, that has been absolutely underscored in the past six months because mm -hmm. it all has been sector by sector, what's done well and what hasn't done well uh, that we've you seen know, dramatically. What are you doing? I just, under, I just learned here, it's like an old Chrysler van, folks. I got a... <laughs> I got a coffee cuppy thing here. Yeah, yeah, it's actually Lucite. It's really lovely. It's, it's, I can put my coffee cup there. My tang. It's, it fits the tang size as well. That's great It's to very know, cool. Wow. <laughs> We're enjoying London. It's we been wonderful. We are enjoying it, I think. We're here. even on speaking terms. Even better. <laughs> futures up 11. Dow futures up 18. This is an important interview as we talk to Jordan Rochester. A different view. George Saravellis, global head of FX, Deutsche Bank. On radio and television, good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Boris Johnson says there's no point in trying to negotiate with Russia's President Vladimir Putin. The British Prime Minister sat down for an interview with Bloomberg. How can you deal with a crocodile uh, when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Uh, you know, what's the, what's the negotiation? Uh, and, and that is what Putin is doing. And any kind of, he will try to freeze the conflict. He will try and call for a ceasefire. Dalton also urged that more sophisticated rocket systems be sent to Ukraine so Ukrainian forces can hit Russian targets farther away. And it is the latest U.S. challenge to China. The Biden administration and Taiwan are planning to announce negotiations to increase economic ties. The talks would focus on enhancing economic cooperation and supply chain resiliency. A deal would fall short of a free trade agreement. Beijing has warned Washington about its relationship with Taiwan. And the White House is scrambling to do something about those record high gasoline prices in an election year. Bloomberg's learned the Biden administration has reached out to the oil industry about restarting sh shuttered refineries. The average price of a gallon of regular unleaded gasoline stood at $4.60 on Wednesday. 
Senate Democrats said they were a bit more optimistic about a compromise with Republicans on gun control legislation in the wake of the Texas school massacre. Democrats appear to be willing to accept incremental steps. Many senators are going home for a 10-day recess and will meet with voters who may pressure them to take action. Global equity funds saw their biggest inflows in 10 weeks, led by U.S. stocks. Investors added about $20 billion to the global stocks in the week that ended Wednesday. Cheaper valuations lured buyers after what's been a steep sell-off on those recession fears. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. One oh nine is where I'm getting my sort of fair value for the euro. But I think given the trade deficits collapsing, given their main trading partner, China, is under right. pressure, given the food crisis, the energy crisis, euro to parity is still possible in the months ahead. Jordan Rochester of Nomura there with a good conversation. We are having wonderful discussions here and no surprise in London on foreign exchange. Lisa Bramlitz and Tom King, yes, John Farrow, scheduled to return uh, here in a number of days. I, he was delayed in Capri, something about jet fuel. And uh, we look forward to seeing him. I believe we all get together again Tuesday in New York. The hallmark of what we invented at Bloomberg Surveillance is difference of opinion. And now you're gonna be hit over the head with a difference of opinion. George Saravellos has to do tag team with Folkerts, Landau, Hooper, Ruskin, and the rest of them at Deutsche Bank. He is aged. He joins us this morning as Global FX uh, Research Head. George, you say this is the mother of all safe haven moves to U.S. dollar. We're looking at euro. We're looking at yen, da-da-da-da-da. And you say focus on the flow to dollars. That's right, Tom. If you look at the last six months, you can see in the data, you've seen a huge accumulation of uh, dollar cash uh, by all investors. So investors have been selling U.S. <laughs> equities, they've been selling U.S. bonds, uh, but they've just been keeping the dollar cash and not only that, um, accumulating even more. But when you look at the size of that accumulation, it's reached historically very high levels, similar to COVID, uh, similar <clears throat> to the Trump trade war. Uh, so as we published our outlook for the next few months, the simple point is the dollar is pricing so much bad news and the market is so overweight, the dollar, that the risk is any sort of margin positive news. And you right. see that historically extreme risk premium start unwinding. With respect to your boss, David Fulkerts Landau, who's worried about fiscal largesse and maybe dollar strength getting out of hand. There's others picking up on this and they're looking for some redux of the Plaza Accord. George, you go the other way and you say, we're not gonna see a redux of Plaza Accord need to weaken dollar. It's gonna happen. Maybe we need a Motel 6 Accord out at Newark Airport uh, in New Jersey. Why are we not gonna need a Plaza Accord? So I think, Tom, the simple answer is the ECB. The ECB will do the job. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, um, the ECB is starting to wake up to the reality that rates need to be raised very quickly. Um, we're only an inflation print away, and let's see what happens next week. Um, but I think we're only an inflation print away uh, from a 50 basis point rate hike from the ECB in the July meeting. And the market has been so focused on the Fed story it's missed the European story. And the European story has uh, a mix of very high inflation, but also outperforming growth. And um, it's surprising how pessimistic the market has consistently been on European growth. Uh, but if you look at data surprises, they're actually moving in favor of Europe. Consensus GDP forecasts for this year are in fact higher for Europe than they are in the US. And the reason is fiscal policy. Europe has a very supportive fiscal policy mix. It's been easing policy to offset the energy cost. It's going to have more defense spending. It has the European, the NGEU fund. Uh, and essentially, I think the stage is being set for a European capex boom. So I am on the optimistic end as far as the European uh, story goes. And I think potentially we have significantly more uh, repricing to have for the ECB. And when you say significantly more pricing, George, you're even looking out uh, to 110 and possibly 120, I believe, uh, going forward versus the dollar. How much would you have to see a weakening to change your view? 
So I think if you take a step back and you look at the euro, um, up until 2014, and this is even during the eurozone crisis, it was in a 120, 140 range. And then one thing happened, the ECB went negative um, during uh, Draghi's tenure, 2014, 2015. And that range shifted from 120 to 140 uh, down to essentially parity, 103, 120. And what I'm most focused on is as the entire European rate structure shifts back to that old regime, that should be a significant structural source of support for the euro, potentially unwinding some of these big um, capital outflows we've seen. And the market is very focused on the deterioration in the European trade balance. But for example, the US balance is deteriorating even faster. And I think the more interesting story going forward is the effect of positive rates in Europe and what do they do to the capital accounts. George, there's also this weird aspect of the dollar, which is that commodities are priced in it, right? So as the dollar weakens, as you predict, that's going to mean even higher costs of fuel, which has been one of the drivers of inflation in the euro region. How much is that factoring into your expectation? So it's interesting because you finally start to see ECB discussions evolve and mention the euro. Um, significantly more. The perfect example of that is um, the French central bank governor. Uh, a few weeks ago, he highlighted the euro in the middle of his speech. Then um, when the euro was going further lower, he, he raised the same sentence and brought it to the top of his speech. Um, a higher euro, um, the correlation has flipped between the euro and commodity prices. So we've been seeing stronger commodities, but a weaker euro, uh, euro at the same time. If the euro reverses course, it starts appreciating. And I think the ECB is very aware of that. It actually reduces some of the imported inflation pressure. Um, and the ECB, I think, is now very focused on the fact that it risks being behind the curve uh, in a similar situation to where the Fed was uh, just a few months ago. George Cervantes, thank you so much for all your work for us. Greatly, greatly appreciate to you and all the team, including Matt Ozzetti, with that out there recession call for Deutsche Bank as well. Lisa, I want to go back to Davos, and as, as George alluded to, but I think you've had huge leadership on this, and that is lockdown, China, boring, let's move on. And you and others have said, no, it's going to end, then what? And to me, besides the ECB meeting next week, will it be good to get Farrell back so we actually know what we're talking about <laughs> be terrific on ECB? Back. We're looking forward to having Pharaoh him back next gets week it. on Us? No. Yeah. But, I mean, but China is a big deal. Especially as we start to get more insight into what some of these lockdowns actually mean uh, with respect to supply chain disruption. But they're going to end. There was a story. Okay, so they're going to end. What happens then? Because then you have a, a population that's not fully immunized. But how do you get there? So and what kind of social unrest do you get on the way? And I say this as there was an article today about uh, the Apple factory, the manufacturers, yeah. and how there are actually a huge, there are huge incidences of unrest in well, some of these places because people have been quarantined from their families, there have been lockdowns, right. there's been so much that's been really problematic. It's TV folks, you make jokes about this, but guess what, you're right, this is not funny. It's not funny. I'm suggesting they don't have a choice. They have to fix this. These are immovable forces yes. for a totalitarian regime. And perhaps this is why Premier uh, Li Keqiang was talking about how this is going to affect the economy in such a big way. There is some <clears throat> speculation that maybe this is the predecessor to a softening in the stance. Well, we will see. I mean, there's a lot out there. Bloomberg with an important article today on the domestic view from Beijing. Uh, really must reading. I'll try to get that out on Twitter. Green on the screen again. Futures up nine. We quote the Dow futures only when Pharaoh's not here. Up 16. The VIX 27.18. Sterling. It's a full English sterling. 126.34. Bloomberg surveillance from London. Lisa Abramowitz and Tom King. Jonathan Farrow. There's been a Farrow sighting. We're pleased to report something about AC Milan. I have no idea what that means. Farrow scheduled Tuesday in America. And yes, we do have Monday off. But uh, Bloomberg, of course, will be monitoring global news on the American uh, Memorial Day. There is today, and on a Friday, you sort of go, Friday, really? There is a ton of American economic data that's beginning to come out looking at things like retail inventories, far more the spending, the income, 
and the PCE deflator as well. Here is, in New York, Michael McKee. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Lisa. Let's talk about the deflators first, because that's the number everybody cares about. It's the Fed's target for inflation. The PCE deflator, the headline number, comes in at two, up two-tenths of percent. That's significantly down from nine-tenths the prior month. And the that makes the year-over-year -year headline number 6.3 percent. Uh, the core, which a lot of people are following because they think the Fed is going to be much more interested in that, given uh, what... Uh, is driving inflation these days. Core up three tenths, same as last month, but that pushes us down into a four handle, 4.9 percent for the PCE core. That's down from 5.2 percent the prior month. So the inflation numbers show a little bit of improvement. Uh, personal income up four tenths on the month. Personal spending up nine tenths on the month. Uh, both of those a tick down from where they were in March, but still healthy numbers. Real personal spending. Spending. This is interesting. Up seven tenths of a percent. It was up only two tenths yeah. last month. And of course, uh, yeah. the issue there is that uh, you have to subtract inflation from the spending numbers. And it looks like spending was reasonably strong even without that. And then the other number that's out this morning is also good news. The advanced good trades balance for April came in at $105 billion. Uh, It was $125 billion last month. And, of course, trade subtracts from GDP. It was a, a big hit to GDP last month because the trade balance had deteriorated to a record low. And so we see some improvement there. Right. But still big, but mathematically it will help. Michael, these are fascinating data, and I think we're going to see a real churn in the market with a two-year yield giving me a fractional uh, lift right now. But I would really stay tuned, folks, to see what those yield dynamics do. Michael, I want you to do what you do best, which is take the inflation data of Mr. Powell's PCE deflator and bring it right over to what we see at 10 o'clock New York time with the one year and the five to 10 year University of Michigan guesstimates on inflation. How does a pro like you link those two together? Well, what's been interesting, it's been interesting, Tom, the last couple of weeks, we have seen inflation break-evens fall in uh, on Wall Street, five- and ten-year uh, numbers coming down as the market seems to accept the fact that the Fed can get inflation under control. So we're watching to see where the consumer is at this point. The New York Fed yeah. puts out a survey of consumer expectations for inflation that found the long-term, uh, three to five years, was 3 percent. So consumers were pretty optimistic about inflation coming down as well. We'll see if that gets confirmed by the University of right. Michigan numbers. In all those numbers, and McKee is expert at this, folks, I'd like, I'll make pretending I'm doing it. I'm going to suggest 5.2% down to 4.9% on the PCE core deflator year over year. Uh, at least it gets my attention. With an equity lift, futures up 13, Dow futures up 30. Continue to look at the markets. Michael McKee, thank you so much. We now synthesize to the global economy and do this with Neil Shearing with always a complex, readable note from Capital Economics joining us in our London studios. Neil, of the, of the, tri the triangle, the tripod that you're looking at of global economics, what interests me is your study of real wages. And what I find fascinating in the United States is on an x-axis, the area under this collapse in the real wage, boy, it's getting long, the intergrand of negative real wages is really getting substantial. How does that affect behavior in the next year? Well, we've got a flavor of that in the data that's just come out, right? We've had uh, personal consumption growing 0.9, but, uh, but incomes growing much less than personal consumption. Consumers are dipping into their savings, and that's what's sustaining the, the health of consumption in the US. Now, you're right that there's been an erosion of real wages in the US, and I think that's gonna start to weigh on uh, demand as we head into next year. Uh, you combine that with what the Fed's doing, rate sensitive sectors, housing I think is going to slow. I don't think there's going to necessarily be a recession though. The strength of the consumer data that we had this morning I think is testament to that. If you're looking for a recession and you're concerned about squeezes in real incomes, then here in Europe is the place to look. The terms of trade shock that Europe has experienced is, is an order of magnitude greater 
than that that the US has experienced as energy prices have surged and that is hitting consumers here in Europe. Before we get to Europe, but I do want to follow on with that, I'd love to get your sense of what it does when people see real negative wages, right? Because we talk about how the consumer continues to spend in the United States and we see that with this data uh, coming in high, uh, faster than expected in the prior month. Does it matter that they're earning even less on an inflation adjusted basis or do they just have so much cash in their savings and frankly the availability of credit to go out and buy whatever they want that it doesn't matter. But again the interesting thing is the different story in the US compared with the Eurozone. In the US there's a much larger fiscal stimulus. Stimulus checks are landing three times in the US. If you look where real incomes are going to be at the end of this year compared to the pre-pandemic level in the US they're going to be a bit higher I think. Uh, despite the surges in inflation that we've had, be just because the nominal income growth through the pandemic was so strong. In Europe, they're going to be down. So it's very controversial, Neil. You talk about the stimulus and the stimulus checks. A lot of people look at them and they blame them for the inflation in the United States today. What's your view on the ramifications of the stimulus? Was it basically uh, more inflationary than anything else and hampering of the consumer in terms of what they can spend in real terms? Or was it actually beneficial in terms of the savings that people have currently? Well, I think I separate the fiscal stimulus from the monetary stimulus to start off with. And on the fiscal side, I think in the initial uh, period of the pandemic, it was absolutely the right thing to do. I think the, the issue, to my mind, was that it probably went too far. The third round was excessive. That's where the problem started. Um, and, and so it wasn't so much that it was the wrong thing to do in and of itself. It was the scale, I think, that was the issue. You know, I, I want to look at the data here right now that Michael McKee was helping us with in the United States. And I think this is something very germane to a more longer term view as well. For those of you on radio, we had a spike higher in the full faith and credit yields in America. And then as we heard from Michael McKee, who was speaking while everyone was acting, uh, maybe not. And those yields have turned around and come in. And I think it'll be fascinating to see. Tell me how, in long-term economics, you use the short-term the short-termism of the bond market to try to guess where the long-term economics is going. How do you use the day-to-day, moment-to-moment fluctuations to observe the confidence of where we're going? Well, I think it's really difficult, and I think is what you've just described <clears throat> uh, shows the danger of ascribing uh, too too much certainty, if you like, or too much importance to short-term moves in the markets because they're up one minute and they're down the other. Um, I think the shape of the curve is arguably more important than day-to-day. -day. What is the shape? The, the new well, flatness. What is exactly it the flatness? Well, yeah, whether it's flattening, whether it's steepening, whether it's going at the long end, or the short end. I mean, the, the, what the market has told us over the last three months really is they think the Fed has got this now. The short ends come down, the long ends come down too, the curve starts to re-steepen. You know, the recession risk is kind of being priced out a bit of the bond market. Inflation concerns are dissipating. Um, I think the, the really interesting point is going to be does inflation come down from eight to five and four? Almost certainly. Does it then get stuck or does the Fed have to go again? So uh, just to sort of wrap it all up with your focus on Europe, saying it's such a different story here, speak to George Cerevelis' claim that we're actually seeing more momentum in the euro region than a lot of people expect and that, frankly, he thinks that the fiscal spending will provide a tailwind that a lot of people discount. What's your view? Well, I think there's, there's some truth to the fact that the incoming data in the eurozone have not been as bad as you might expect. We saw that we had the PMIs earlier this week. They, were, they help a, a bit better than we had had anticipated and that many others had anticipated. Uh, but I come back to the fundamentals here, which is that Europe, unlike the US, is a huge net energy importer and it's the prices of that energy that has skyrocketed over the past 12 months. The terms of trade have, terms of trade have collapsed. That is manifesting itself in a huge squeeze on consumers and there's not much that fiscal policy can do to offset that. We had a big package here in the U UK right. yesterday. It only offsets about half of the squeeze in disposable incomes. Quick, quickly, get us here to Christian Malik, our interview of the day on hydrocarbons here in a moment with J.P. Morgan. What is your call on Brent crude one year out and why? I think it's going to stay elevated for the next six to nine months. Uh, I think it might then start to diminish, but it's not going to collapse. I think it's going to come off a bit. There's going to be some demand destruction. I think we'll get a bit more. Is $100 the new $60? I think we're going to be, I would imagine, 12 months out, somewhere between 90 and 100 is where we're going to be.
Interesting. Okay. Neil Shearing, thank you so much. Great to thank see you. you here. Neil Shearing of Capital Economics. He's helped us, Lisa, many times before, including New Year's Eve shows. <laughs> well, that's because fantastic. He's the only one who shows up sober. It's well, great. honestly, I think that what he just was saying there was fascinating about the importation of a lot of the hydrocarbons in Europe. And again, this makes me wonder what the constraint is around the dollar weakening too much, because that will only jack up the prices more mm -hmm. and create a real issue. It's just, it's a very complicated scenario, but the, the, different, uh, the different outlooks for both <clears throat> Europe and the US continues to be a theme. I'm gonna go to the back end of the GDP equation, and Neil Dodd of Renaissance Capital does that right now. I think we're looking at this holistically, and I'm looking at it as domestic, Y equals C plus I plus G, and then you got all the noise on the back end with net exports and imports. And Dutta observes, with his classic Dutta optimism, that it's about a resilient American economy and services being the key dynamic as we open up. We're completely focused on goods now. Yeah, well, a lot of people would agree with him, although the services ISM that we got out recently <laughs> was not very good, right? It came in disappointing. Yeah. So there's all of these noisy numbers that are yeah. coming out and making it difficult to really know. Grandma, way too optimistic this morning. We'll have to fix that next Tuesday. It was the English coming breakfast. Coming up with our question, our interview of the day on oil. Christian Malik of J.P. Morgan with their important research on resilient and higher oil prices. From London, Lisa Abramus and Tom Keen. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Boris Johnson pulled no punches when Bloomberg asked about the prospect of negotiating with Vladimir Putin. The British Prime Minister responded, how can you deal with a crocodile when it's in the middle of eating your left leg? Johnson said that the Russian president is completely not to be trusted. For the first time in two years, profits at Chinese industrial firms declined last month. Industrial profits fell 8.5% in April from a year ago. COVID outbreaks and lockdowns disrupted disrupted factory production, transport logistics and sales. And it's a heartening development for the Federal Reserve, but maybe not for American workers. Staffing firms say that companies are now becoming more cautious after handing out hefty salary increases over the last year. Economists expect data to show annual wage growth this month was 5.2%, down from 5.5% in April. The Fed sees wage growth as a big source of inflation. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott reportedly has dropped plans to address the National Rifle Association's annual meeting in person today. The NRA is meeting meeting in Houston just days after the school massacre in Uvalde, Texas. According to the Dallas Morning News, Abbott will be in Uvalde. He'll deliver a taste message to the NRA. Instead, former President Trump will deliver his speech in person. And movie theater owners in the U.S. hope the next movie, Top Gun Maverick, gives them a supersonic boost. The sequel to Tom Cruise's 1986 blockbuster is expected to bring in $130 million in its opening weekend. That would make it the third biggest box office opening since the start of the pandemic. Over the last two years, millions of consumers have gotten used to watching movies at home on streaming services. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think the Fed is going to have to decide between two policy mistakes. Hit the brakes too hard and risk a recession or tap the brakes in a stop-go pattern, including pause in September would be an example of that, and risk having inflation well into 2023. Our giant of game theory, Mohamed al in the University of Cambridge, thrilled he could be with us this morning, except then, as I said earlier, he hung up on me because I care more about Christian Malik than I do Mohamed al -Aryan. And I know Dr. al in his very busy day uh, at Cambridge will listen in to these important words on your headache, my headache, everybody's headache globally, global energy and oil. Christian Malik is global energy strategist at J.P. Morgan. Their London shop has dropped 100 pages on where we are, we are going, and the vector is $150 a barrel somewhere out there. Christian, thrilled to have you join us. It's great to be here live with you, uh, 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 This morning. Christian, I want to talk about the complex microeconomics here Mm. And we have lots of people looking at it. Ed Morris at Citigroup, the great Jeff Curry, microeconomist at Goldman Sachs. What's the distinction of J.P. Morgan research is everyone looks for a new energy regime. 
Yeah, it's, it's, you, you sort of said it in the question, which is commodities. This is not about commodities. This is about oiling. This is about molecules, energy molecules. How do we find jewels? Um, you know, whatever form it is, whether it's clean, you know, fossil fuel. And the issue with approaching it through a much more kind of holistic way is that when you start looking for jewels, effectively, or energy, we're quickly running short into a major deficit of energy. Okay, uh, I, I got to interrupt you because this is massive jargon, folks. Jewels is not boodles around the corner <laughs> where you buy two carrots out of guilt on your way back to New York. Jewels is J-O-U-L-E-S, and this is thermodynamics and the energy Exactly, creation. exactly, Continue. not the crown jewels. Exactly, and I think on that point, when we then look for energy um, and look across all the fuels that we have, be it oil, gas, renewables, there lies the issue that when you think about how to solve for that deficit, you've got to find energy that can also be used to produce chemicals, to produce tires for those Teslas. Equally, you're also trying to find energy for the EM world that doesn't have the infrastructure. And what that effectively means is that being sure that energy, we seem to come back to fossil fuels. Did you see how he got that jab in on Teslas? He's so, so he got no, the tires. Did I say are, that? The <laughs> tires are made of oil. Well, Elon, it's did you know Everything. that? I mean, Continue. we even heard that from Bridgewater that even the renewables, you have to get the stuff out of yeah. the ground first. Christian, why aren't oil prices higher, given your thesis? Well, interestingly, when you sort of run through the deficits and all the different fuels, um, we're, we're effectively we're effectively fully loaded out apart from oil and oil there is still spare capacity but that spare capacity is quickly running dry it's mainly in saudi mainly in opec now it's a good question and oil prices should be higher if you think about the marginal cost to produce the oil um it's getting close to 100 now that's that's different to the 40 that you hear when you talk about it on the ground and it's the difference between 40 and 100 is the price, the cash flow needed to feed the equity, the shareholders, now the social tax with windfall. All of these things are inflationary because you've got to pay all these things, feed all these mouths before you actually put an extra dollar into oil capex, and that's around 100. You then add on 20 to 30 in terms of what is this lack of spare capacity worth? Historically, it's been between 30 and 40 dollars. So in other words, there is a lot of upside to, 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 to energy prices from him. So translate $125 a barrel into gasoline prices based on the refineries? Yeah, I mean, our commodities team have done this work and we're sort of heading towards $6 potentially by, 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 by the second half. In the United half. States. Absolutely. So you're going to see this pass through in terms of retail prices. And therefore, there's a question then, when does demand respond? How does mm -hmm. demand respond? But the key here is that we have never been um, below 5% spare capacity globally in the world. Um, and that equates to a much bigger premium for oil than what you'd expect it to be given it doesn't cost that much to produce it. Yeah. One of the huge supporters of what I've done is Daniel Jurgen, And you oh, and I yeah. had to read Giant. cover to cover the prize years ago. This is, folks, you, you bought the prize just to walk around campus and look cool. It didn't matter if you read it. Yeah. But the answer is Jurgen would say they hold the power of the prize. What is the power the Saudis hold given the JP Morgan view? Well, interestingly, you know, I remember very well when we, when we launched our bullish view in, in spring of 2020, uh, and I remember speaking to OPEC and the Saudis, and, and, and they were still investing, still investing in the wells so that when needed, they could switch them on. Now, I remember in the summer of 2020, why would we need those wells? Why did we, we have too much oil, demands at 75 million barrels, but they did the right thing. They were counter-cyclical. They continued to invest in their total capacity. Yeah. Here we are two years later, and now we need those barrels, and the only one that's available to add those barrels, because they invested when everyone wasn't, are the Saudis. Yeah. So if we get $6 a barrel, uh, $6 ga uh, a gallon gasoline, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Mm. Are we going to get demand destruction? Have we reached that point of demand destruction, or will it keep climbing? Short answer, no. I think we can cope with those prices. In fact, I think we can cope with oil prices significantly higher over a period of time. And it, coming back to the Energy Outlook report that we did, mm -hmm. one thing we discovered is the resilience of emerging markets to higher prices. Why? Because their bar is much lower. This is not about do I cycle to work, do I you know, drive to work? Mm -hmm. This is about living. And when you think about the cross in terms of, sort of the conflict that they have, do we buy right. oil for $150 <clears throat> oil? or do we suffer the consequences, hunger, riots, revolutions, or whatever? So in, that right. is a much, much more difficult crossroad, and that's why we think yeah. the resilience will be much higher. Jamie from New York emails in. He says, Christian, do you support the windfall profit tax? Do I support it? I think ultimately, if it helps consumers, um, yes. But the problem is, all it's doing is creating an inflationary backdrop for oil, because now the majors have to pay more tax when they could have otherwise invested 
and that all that does is raise the break evens. Remember all those fouls, all those sort of all those mouths they have to feed. So whether it's the equity, the debt, the project, you now know you've got another mouth to feed, which is additional taxes into into right. UK Gov. So again, what's the oil price need to raise that capex in oil? It's just gone up significantly. That's inflationary foil. Christian Malik, thank you so much for joining us here thank in you. London today. He's with J.P. Morgan. As I've said before, we always protect the copyright of all of our guests' research material. I urge you to go to J.P. Morgan and get your hands on their important 100 pages. You agree, you disagree with it, other people go the other way. It will make you more informed about these price economics. Are we done on TV? We're done on TV. We're that was a week. Okay. It's a wrap. We, you and I got through the week. I mean, we're not in speaking terms, but it's okay. We're kind of speaking we're next to each other on podium podia podia podia, podia. Oh, yeah yeah well they move you know it's they, like it's they, like yours moves okay coming up oh, david weston will not go like <laughs> oh no that noise what is going on <laughs>